Okay, there we go. Now I can see everybody. All right. Welcome, friends. So good to see you all. Um, and I think we're going to just jump right in. I'm going to share my screen. Um, when I do that, I become pretty small, but I think you can kind of adjust my size. And you can also um, make some choices around what you can see. But for now, all right, do you all see the PowerPoint? All right, good, I see some nods. And also I can't see everybody. So if you have questions at any point, please use the raise hand function on Zoom because that pops you to the top of my screen and I'll be able to see you. But right now with my um, PowerPoint up, I can't really see everybody. Um, let's get started. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so ex excited to be sharing this with you all. Like Melissa said, this is a topic really near and dear to my heart. And I think it's just so important that we bring wellness into how we actually share our wellness practices. And, um, and yeah, let's get started. I'll talk all about it as we get in there. Um, but to begin, my name is Itzel Hayward. Uh, I use pronouns she, her. And I wanna start with a short guided meditation. So why don't you uh, come to a comfortable seated position, standing, lying down, sitting, standing, lying down, however you're comfortable. And you can lower the eyes and soften the gaze or even gently close the eyes if that's comfortable. Taking in a deep breath, exhaling and allowing the body to relax and release any unnecessary tension. Allow the breath to be neutral and bring the awareness to the parts of the body connected to the surface beneath it, the surface it's resting on. This surface which is resting on or being supported by the earth And take a moment to recognize the divinity of the earth and the divinity of this sacred land that we're located on. This land that's been cared for by indigenous people for thousands of years, whose familial descendants are alive and flourishing members of our communities. this land that was and continues to be of great importance to them. Let's just take a moment to recognize that we've benefited and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. And let's hold in our hearts and in our minds that this land, this earth, isn't simply a physical foundation or a resource to be exploited, but a living entity that provides sustenance and nourishment for all of life. May we honor its sacred presence and strive to walk upon it with humility and gratitude. Let's also take a moment to recognize that as healers, you are also a sacred presence. You hold space for others, offering love, compassion, and support. And this time together is a time to nurture and replenish your own energy.
attention to your heart center and visualize a soft healing light emanating from the heart and surrounding your body, gently enveloping the body in its soothing energy. Nurture, nurturing and revitalizing the physical body, the mental body, the emotional body, and the spiritual body. Honoring yourself and the sacred work that you do as healer. and recognizing that your true nature is peace. And as you're ready, gently lifting or opening the eyes. And welcome friends. So you're likely here because you are passionate about promoting wellness and want to make it your livelihood in a way that's in integrity with your values of a healer. And for me and my wellness practice, that means respecting the roots of the practices I offer and also navigating capitalist systems like business structures and finances and legal and marketing but doing it without adopting capitalist ideals that prioritize profits over people or profits over the planet, which is directly counter to wellness. And so it's through that lens that I'm gonna be sharing with all of you today. And wherever you are in your business journey, whether you're just starting out or you're, you've been on this path for a while, I'm really glad you're here, so welcome. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about me. And I'm just going to check one thing here. Okay, we have some folks coming into the waiting room. So I'm going to go ahead and admit them. All right. All right, welcome, friends. Welcome, welcome. Wonderful timing because I'm just about to tell you a little bit about me. So my name is Itzel Hayward. Again, I use pronouns she, her, and I'm a child of two Panamanian immigrants. And I grew up middle class in a predominantly white upper middle class town. Um, I went to public schools and a public university and then to a private law school, eventually becoming a lawyer here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which, um, which is where I am now, which is on the unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people. Uh, I worked primarily at nonprofit and government agencies, although I did spend some time in the private sector. I spent one year um, at a law firm in San Francisco and one year at a tech company uh, during the dot-com boom in the 90s. Um, but other than that, I've spent um, the last 20 years, I think. I'm on 20 years very soon, over 20 probably by now, um, working primarily in nonprofits and government. And these identities and experiences, along with many others, of course, deeply shaped my views on capitalism. Um, growing up, particularly once I got to college, I really started viewing the ideals of capitalism very, very critically. And I felt, and I still do feel, that the ideals promoted by capitalism, uh, particularly its effects on marginalized communities, communities of color, is very exploitative and very detrimental to uh, the health and the well-being of, um, of all people and of the planet. Um, but I also really struggled with this idea that my worth was tied to my social status, specifically my education and my professional prestige. So being a lawyer really satisfied that. Um, and it also came with a, a more, a higher income than I'd ever experienced before. Um, so that was really new for me and came with a lot of learning and navigating, um, learning how to live, um, particularly in a community that had um, 
a professional community that have had a much higher income level than I'd grown up with or that I'd known. Um, and it really helped me appreciate how money at some level, at some point, absolutely made life easier. Um, I'm grateful that because of my background and my beliefs, it made it easier for me to resist a lot of the consumerism um, that kind of comes with that world um, or that my experience, it came with that world. So I was able to, to save a lot of money. I paid off my loans ahead of schedule. And when I decided to leave my career uh, because of my own um, dissatisfaction and disillus disillusionment and also just my own mental and physical well-being and very serious critiques I had of the legal system itself, I had a solid safety net. So I always like to be really clear about that. I'm not someone who will say, um, oh, just quit your day job and start a new business. Um, if you want to do that, by all means do. But that's not my full picture. Uh, so I always like to be really upfront about that. Um, and when it did come time to start uh, planning, planning my path out of the law, I decided I'd start by being a coach. Um, so in 2008, I became a certified coach. Um, I became, I, I had some really extensive communication skills training. Um, and then eventually I became a certified yoga teacher as well. Um, and then in 2010, I officially left my career and started my wellness business, Attuned Living. Um, and when I started, I mostly focused on coaching and then gradually wove in teaching yoga and other holistic healing practices as I gained more experience, uh, more teaching and sharing experience in that. And then in 2020, we, you know, 2020 happened and I started seriously exploring um, just changes to who I was serving with my, with Attuned Living and how I was serving them. And I, I would say it's taken me until pretty recently to feel a bit more settled about that. Um, and today I offer Reiki, yoga, and other mindfulness-based trainings and programs. So that's a little bit about me um, and the journey that I took. But I'll also say this, that when I first started Attuned Living, I very quickly discovered this tension between wanting this practice to sustain me um, and curious if it could sustain me at the level of a, as my legal career. I, I just didn't know. I was curious about that. Um, but also not wanting to embrace and adopt the capitalist ideals that were so harmful and had been so harmful to my family, my communities, and globally. Um, and so navigating this has been really tricky for me, especially in the early years, made a lot of mistakes, which we'll talk about today. Um, and so today what I'm gonna be sharing really is based on my own experience. And so this is why I really wanted to give you, I don't usually have this long of an introduction, um, but I really wanted to share my own experience because everything I share today is really gonna be through that lens. You know, as you can see, I don't have a formal education in business or economics. So what I'm gonna be teaching is really gonna be a combination of what I've learned from experts I've worked with over the years, but also from my own experience, uh, my own personal experience, including the mistakes I made and where I'm still learning and growing. So that's me. And I would love to give you all an opportunity to get to know each other a bit better too. Um, I'm gonna admit one more person who just entered the waiting room. Um, and then, oh, I wanted to put you in the breakout groups. Um, but instead, since we don't have breakout groups, I'm gonna just let everyone, let's see, let me look how many people we have here. Okay, a good little number. Um, I think I'll just jump ahead actually um, to ask a question of the group. Oh, this is gonna be interesting. I had a lot of breakout groups planned today. So I'm just realizing we're gonna, we're gonna get creative today. Um, so I'm just gonna ask, what are you all hoping to get out of today? And then I'm gonna tell you what my hopes are for today. I'm gonna take notes on what you all say and, um, and, and adjust accordingly so that I could give you what, you what you want or what you're looking for. So get start, you can get started. Just, you can speak out into the group, drop it in the chat, raise your hand. I'm happy with just speaking out. So you're welcome to do that as well. Um, let's see. Oh, I see a bunch of stuff in the chat first. Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, free conference call number. Oh, thank you. Um, I think we're good. Can we avoid promoting folks from calling them? Oh, private message to me. 
All right, so we're going to move away from using the term healers is the request um, and move toward wellness practitioners or workers. And I know I have a habit of calling folks healers. I don't typically call myself a healer, um, but I do have a habit of calling um, folks healers. So um, if, if you want to say more about why that's uh, not comfortable, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I will also I will say why I don't feel comfortable calling myself a healer is because I really believe that people's healing comes from themselves. So I'm not healing you. I'm not healing the people who um, I work with, but really they're healing. I want to empower them with their own healing and I'm able to provide some tools that I hope support that. Um, but if there's more anyone wants to say about that. Uh, that, that. that request was written from me. Um, Thanks, Mel. And I can speak to that unless you've been um unless you've been honored by um your tribe leaders the curanderas then um in this space that i've created i would really appreciate the respect of not disrespecting something that is is earned um is a lineage so wellness workers wellness practitioners by all means, if within your tribe or your community, you have done the work or it is in direct lineage, absolutely. Um, but in this space, I would prefer that we refrain from um, egocentric terms. Beautiful, thank you so much for sharing that, Mel. So, okay, I'm gonna officially turn back to the question then. So what are you all hoping to get out of today? I see some answers in the chat, but also speak out if you have an answer that you'd rather share that way. Uh, this is Candy. For me personally, I'm at least using this as a stepping stone um, to kind of tread this earth uh, in, in a, in a more aware, less harmful way. And I'm in engineering, not necessarily wellness, but it's, it's, you know, it's rife with harmful practices. And so I'm, I'm just trying to uh, instill some, some less harmful to start with. Um, and also on my own personal wellness journey making sure I don't uh, facilitate harm um, by, by having this perspective that you're providing today. Beautiful, thank you so much, Candy. Yeah, everything I'm offering, I'm framing as being around um, wellness practices and wellness businesses and for wellness practitioners, but it's absolutely universal. So I hope that you find it helpful in, in all the ways you wanna bring it into your, to your world, so. Great. This happens to come at a moment where it almost feels like the universe decided to put it in front of me. Um, I'm opening my own brick and mortar on Thursday, which is nothing that I ever desired. <laughs> um, but quite honestly, the combination of that and moving back into a space that I own that I lived in eight years ago, pre-marriage, pre-divorce, pre-child, the combination of those two things are gonna end up being less expensive than where I'm currently residing. So this was the way that I found to make it work so that I could continue to offer some of the physical practices that I offer and have a safe space for me and my child. So in the midst of all this, what I've been running around saying even more than I usually say it is, I wasn't built for capitalism. I, I just wasn't. I, I grew up in a collective, you know, in an activist community in New York City, and then went to college and was rudely awakened <laughs> by a lot of things. Uh, but I also have sort of played in other worlds. Like I worked on Wall Street. I'm a Wharton MBA. I somehow... Um, the new commercial space has got to work and I'm still a full-time single mother and I'm never going to be that person who 
is all about the dollars. Like I, so anyway, this, like I said, this just feels like divine timing, if you will. And I apologize in advance, as I shared with Itzel, I may be in and out because of the kid, um, but I am very appreciative of this. And I don't even know what the definite, like the specific concrete thing is, but I'm supposed to be here. And I am very grateful that this is happening. Love it. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be sharing space with you today. So wonderful I feel like to have it's you. Overdue. <laughs> Way overdue. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And congratulations to you. I see in the chat there's some messages to you there as well. Awesome, friends. All right. And I'm going to go, go through the chat here. I got some um, uh, responses in the chat. <laughs> Yes, we will learn about my mistakes for sure. Um, oh, and I wanted to say too, uh, something you said, Anka, you said, um, I didn't write it down, but you said, uh, I wasn't built for capitalism. And I love that. I thought that was beautiful because I think that as human beings living in community, we're not, this is not how it's going to work. <laughs> capitalism, it's not going to work. It's not sustainable for all of us. So um, I just loved, I loved that phrasing of that. Um, Yes, to being in conversation, yeah. And it's all, yeah. I, wanna, yeah. I wanna compliment you and thank you because it's something that it didn't occur to me um, for sharing the honesty of your journey, um, which is, I, I wanna, I just quickly wanna express though, um, I come from the opposite side of not having access, not having money. And um, both ways can be done to get into your own business. And I just want to speak to that. So if you're someone like me who scraped by to go back to school at age 40 and was in a room full of people with multiple degrees and it wasn't a blip for them because they had been working on Wall Street or working in Silicon Valley um, and it was just another degree. And for me, it was like a like scraping by fundraising to go back to school. You can do it. So I'm speaking to those that might be on the other end like me. You can do it. It's well within your power. I love that. Absolutely. I absolutely don't think that um, everyone's coming from the same place or that there's only one way to do this. For every person here, there's a way to do this, right? And the path is going to look different from, for, from everyone. Um, so yeah, and, and thank you for, for that acknowledgement, Mal. And I do, I like to be honest about my path because this, this was what my path looked like. Um, but I expect everyone's path to look different and I believe you all can do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, I live close to your new space. I'm super excited about that. All right, friends. So I think we can do all of this. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything in here that I didn't have planned. So I'm super excited. And of course, ask questions. Um, I don't, I love uh, more dialogue in my workshops. I don't like just being unidirectional, just like me talking. Um, so please ask questions, um, share your experiences. Like Mel, I loved hearing your story. Share your experiences, share your doubts, criticisms. It's all welcome. So, uh, and you know, the raising hand feature is helpful because then I'll see you. But if I don't see you or you don't hear see me uh, uh, reaching out to you, just unmute and speak. I'm, I love that too. So, all right, great. So. I don't think I told you my hopes for today. So my hopes for today is that by the end of this session today, we'll have uncovered some of the tensions between uh, capital ideals and true wellness. And I don't even think uncovered is the right right word, but have explored more deeply. Because um, I hear you, I see from your reactions and hear what you're saying that you're already aware of this tension. So we're just gonna talk about it more. Um, hopefully we'll have aligned your wellness calling or whatever your calling is with a new approach. Uh, we'll have analyzed some of the practical, legal, and financial issues of running uh, any business, but I'm going to be talking again from the perspective of a well wellness business. We'll have explored how to operationalize your practice within a holistic framework, and by that I just mean what your day-to-day -day looks like in a way that is holistic and in line with your values. And we'll have looked at some strategies for maintaining focus and setting what are called SMART goals in the coaching world. And, um, and also navigating obstacles for moving forward.
right? Because we all have our own, like, like we already talked about, we all have our own path. And that means we're all going to, we're all going to have our own unique challenges as well. So how do we work through those? We're going to talk a little bit about that. All right. So I'm going to start. It's, I probably shouldn't have named this understanding capitalism. It should be more like understanding how Itzel thinks about capitalism, because that's really what I'm going to offer you today. Um, so we're going to just talk about capitalism a little bit because this is really the system that we're operating in on a grander scale when we think about, particularly when we think about uh, being business owners um, and wellness practitioners. Um, and these are the ideals that I've been working so hard to actively resist in both my life and my business. Um, so let me just talk about it really generally, right? So how I understand capitalism is that it's an economic system and it's characterized by several specific um, traits, but some of them are that business and resources used for production should be owned and controlled by private individuals or companies, not by the state or by the community. Um, that the exchange of goods and services should be done through uh, market mechanisms, meaning businesses should make their own decisions about what they make, how they make it, and what price to sell it at based on um, supply and demand, the dynamics of supply and demand, and then just the importance of profit maximization. So that's just like a textbook summary of capitalism. When I look at that, I actually, I have some criticisms, but um, what we need to remember is that capitalism doesn't just exist as a theory or in a vacuum, right? How it actually plays out in a society depends on what values are emphasized in that society. And so that's where my criticisms really skyrocket. Um, and that's because of the, the, the complex interplay between the historical and political and economic and social factors, right, that exist in our own society. So when we overlay capitalism on the social, the societal realities that I've lived in and I've experienced, um, not having grown up in a, a situation um, that Anka, you were talking about growing up in a collective, I wish I had gotten to see that um, before being kind of thrust out rudely awakened into how a lot of the society operates. Um, but we see capitalism operating in a way that actually um, prioritizes profit over people's well-being. So already we see a tension, right, with our wellness practices because people's well-being is the lifeblood of what we do. So when we're benefiting profit, when we're prioritizing profit over people's well-being, there's an immediate tension with our wellness practices. Um, as I also experience capitalism, it disregards this, uh, the social and environmental consequences of, uh, of whatever it's doing to prioritize profit again. And then finally, it perpetuates systems of oppression. In other words, in the creation of this society where the economy depended on slavery, right? That's how our, our economic system came to pass. Um, capitalism was founded and built from that. And in that context, capitalism necessarily impacts people differently based on their race and, and many, many, many other intersecting identities, including gender, ethnicity, class, physical ability, sexual orientation, on and on, right? So to put it more plainly, capitalism, as it was created and continues to manifest in this society, really relies on the exploitation of people who hold marginalized identities. Um, so if you're not familiar with the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones, I highly, highly recommend it that you check it out. She talks a lot about this. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and creator of the 1619 project, which is actually an original docu series on Hulu now, highly recommend. Uh, it's also a podcast, um, and she's incredible. Um, and in this, in the 1619 project, which she created, she looks at the legacy and impact of slavery in the United States. And as she very, very powerfully puts it, um, let me go back. I have a quote from her here. If you believe you can do anything to someone as long as it makes you a profit, including buy, sell, and torture them then what will you not do, right? So that is the destructive nature of capitalism in a country where capitalism was built on slavery. So this is what we're working with, right? These are the systems we're working within. And the way these ideals play out in the wellness space is it often skews wellness practices themselves, right? By encouraging the commodification of them and stripping them of their original uh, cultural value of, um, 
of their uh, cultural roots to encourage a more mainstream appeal and fast consumption. Um, it actually brings me back a little bit to what uh, you were saying, Mel, about using the term healer, right? That that term has been um, in, in a lot of spaces and I, you know, I'm guilty of it, right? I said it at the start, I called everyone healers. It's been stripped away from the word, the cultural uh, significance has been stripped away. Um, in a lot of spaces. So we're fighting back against this. I'm fighting back against this. Um, but this emphasis uh, of making wellness practices um, fit into capitalist ideals also leads to really inequitable and exploitative practices and systemic imbalances, which creates big and clear diversity uh, disparities in wealth and in well-being, where some people are made more well while others are made more ill. Um, it sells this narrative that equates material wealth with happiness and fulfillment, which as wellness practitioners, of course, we know this isn't true, but it does this to the point that it actually encourages going after material wealth to the detriment of the well-being of not only others, our families, our communities, our planet, but even to ourselves, right? We, we hear so much about... Um, grind culture there's another expression i'm trying to think of right and this is to our own the detriment of our own well-being it also plays places a really high value on individualism and competition instead of cooperation and collaboration um, and my experience has been that even the well-intended movement toward what some people like to call compassionate capitalism doesn't really fully address this problem right i I've seen wellness techniques offered in companies and in corporations, um, but then they misuse these as tools for profit maximization, like offering um, their employees yoga classes instead of actually addressing systemic issues within the organization, like people having inadequate health care, right? So the, the, the tension is real, and what we're trying to do together here today is really uh, is big. And I'm going to pause. This was my really big talky point, point part. Um, but I want to pause for a moment. I'm gonna pop into the chat. I see some new chats coming in, and hustle culture. Yes, that's another one. Um, thank you so much for dropping um, all this in the chat, Heather. Super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones in the 1619 Project. It's also in the workbook. I'm gonna drop the link in the for the workbook in the chat once more. Um, so please check it out. Um, and as with someone with a chronic illness, the wellness culture can be very toxic and harmful. Absolutely. Yes, as Mel alluded to at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I would love to hear, are there other things coming up for folks as we talk about capitalism and wellness? Anything else that is, comes to mind before we kind of shift away from this, this part? And I'm grabbing the link to the workbook while, while I wait for y'all feedback. And anyone that joined late um, and might not be able to download the workbook, we just need for you to go into the chat, send a private message to the Banyan Wellness team, which is me, with your email, and I will email you the PDF, so directly to your inbox. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah, or if you can't see the chat, um, uh, you can't see my messages in the chat, you can do that as well. I think All right, if so. I could just oh, I just think I just want to add like how important the the point about the commodification and the commercialization. I mean, it can really take some of these very deep cultural practices and strip them to now like people I've heard from people in brown bodies who say they don't feel comfortable in like yoga classes, right? Or people in big bodies that don't feel comfortable in a yoga class, right? And like the the this came from a certain culture and a certain background and now it's like you have to look a certain way and buy certain products to even show up in a class to like meditate I don't know it's so important to, like that's just such an important part it's just stripping away and it's like this uh, commodification but also like a systemic dismantling of really rich materials and practices and and roots that have been developed over centuries. Um, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> yes, thank you. Exactly. That's what I want to hear from folks. Thank you. And I heard you say, Mel, that's colonization. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, and these practices are deeply, profoundly sacred, many of them, right? And then they suddenly become like an object you can buy, you know, with the highest profit margins for the seller. I mean, it's, yes, it's taking us very far away from what well, and began. even, and I guess I'll just add one more other point. I see it now happening with psychedelic use and wow i don't know also psychedelics also i see this happening now too and i'm like where is this gonna go i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely Ooh, that opens up a whole new thing for me about just like the criminalization of drugs and who gets in trouble and how much you know what the um ramifications are for people depending on whether they're in brown bodies or not brown and black bodies or not so so much to unpack here. We could have a whole day on this. We could have our whole four hours on this and still be talking, right? So yeah, thank you so, so much. Um, yes, and I see in the chat, White Sage, White Sage, Copal. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about that. Yes, thank you so much, Melissa. All right, so I'm going to, um, yeah, so we can see it's really, really clear how all this moves us away from the true essence of wellness, true essence of these practices, which are sacred and powerful and about fostering holistic health and harmony, both within ourselves and within our relationships with others and in our relationship with the planet. So wellness, right, as opposed to these capital ideals, our capitalist ideals are really about valuing care and community and connection over this constant quest for growth and profit. It's really about honoring the inherent worth of each and every one of us, of all beings, the planet, recognizing our interdependence instead of perpetuating systems of inequality and inequity and exploitation. So I just want to share a quick story about um, the founder of Integral Yoga, where I studied yoga, um, uh, uh, then by the name of Satchidananda Saraswati, who was asked, he was invited by a, a consortium of doctors, of medical doctors, um, and was asked by this room full of doctors how he defined the difference between illness and wellness. And he walked up to the back blackboard at the front of the room. It was a blackboard at the time. It probably would be a whiteboard if it were today, but at the time it was a blackboard and he wrote the word illness on the board. And then he wrote the word wellness on the board. And then what he did was he circled the eye of wellness and then he circled the we, the eye of illness, excuse me, and the we of wellness and said, that's the difference, right? It's that eye, that little eye, the belief that we're a separate self that makes us ill. And it's the experience of we, that sense of, co of, of community, of the collective that really brings us home to our belonging. Our healing comes when we start enlarging our sense of who we are to that sense of community that's wellness and i just went to this beautiful dance performance um, of a friend of mine I, I put in a plug but they're not performing again in the bay area for a while um but her name is liz Bu liz Dur duran bubihan i highly recommend from the pinata dance collective and she shared a quote last night from gabor mate that said safety is not the absence of threat but the presence of connection. And I loved that. And I think that that's a beautiful definition also of wellness, right? It's we're moving toward wellness when we recognize that we are some part of something bigger. Um, and this, this, and self-care must uh, include community care. We're gonna talk about that today too. Yes, Mel. Um, and I love this story too. Yes, and it's really one of my inspirations when I think about moving away from capitalist ideals in the wellness space. This is where I, like, this is kind of my touchstone. And I believe that it absolutely can be done. Um, so we're going to do this in the big group. Um, I would love for you to think about ways you have seen organizations or individuals challenge traditional capitalist norms in a way that you admire. And this could be in the wellness space or outside of the wellness space. And I would love to know what about their approach inspires you. Beautiful. Yeah, folks, I'm just gonna call it out that, I mean, we're in it right now. It's. I have to say Banyan <laughs> comes to mind first. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Operating in a capitalist space, but in a way that works for everyone, that builds community, that supports and promotes wellness, right? It's so beautiful. In, in particular, in those communities that have been harmed the most by capitalism. So yeah, totally. Love it. Love it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was obviously going to say Banyan as well. Um, Banyan has completely changed my life. Um, but we all know Banyan, we're here. So one that we might not know is Sankofa Roots. Um, they are based out of um, the Bay Area. They, they are for Black, Indigenous, and queer people. And they go into the wilderness to teach how to forage and build shelters and find water and all of these tools that used to be innate to us and we have just forgotten. So um, if you identify as Black, queer, or Indigenous, Sankofa Roots is a great organization to check out. Awesome. Love it. That sounds amazing. And I'm not familiar with that organization. I'll absolutely check it out. Glide in San Francisco, Spirit Works in Oakland. Yes, they're out there, right? These organizations are out there and they can absolutely inspire us, right? As we move forward, like it can be done despite like kind of this pushing, like a swimming upstream almost, I feel like we need to do. And as we work together, that movement becomes much easier. So yes, the Mayan Wisdom Project, love it. Um, Sankofa Roots on Instagram, and they have a website. I will absolutely be checking that out. So yes, I love it. And you could keep dropping those in the chat as they come up. So thank you. All right, I, I'll, I'll add one thing. It's not in the wellness space so much, but I remember when I first, I was living in San Francisco for many years and then moved to the East Bay in Oakland where I am now. And um, one of the things I really missed about San Francisco and still do is Rainbow Grocery. Um, which is a beautiful, <laughs> I see people share. yes, it's a cooperative grocery store, amazing space. Um, that, that's one of the things, that's one of the organizations that really inspires me that they can operate the, the way they do. Um, <laughs> take all our money, exactly, yes to Rainbow. My local Buy Nothing group, absolutely, oh my gosh. If it weren't for Buy Nothing, I might, it were, there are two things, three things, to actually that like, keep me on Facebook and buying nothing is one of the three and I will share another one of the three with you in a little bit but um and then the third one is my mom's of color Facebook group <laughs> which I also love um but yeah absolutely buy nothing right w operating outside of this um uh consumerist framework right like we're doing it and I love that we're doing it in on Facebook right which is like to me, like just like the epitome of capitalism. <laughs> so it's awesome that we're able to do that, right? And we can do that when we come together. We can do that when we come together. So awesome. Buy Nothing has an app, leave Facebook. All right, thank you. <laughs> Get the app, friends. Get the app. All right, friends. Oops. All right. So um, so when I started my business, right? And keep keep dropping them in the chat. Don't let don't let me stop you. You you'll have all these these this next slide in your whole workbook. So um yes all right do but good yay buy nothing um so i knew when i first started attuned living i was going to have to nap, uh, navigate capitalism and capitalist structures and how was i going to do this right um especially you know especially having this legal background i was so in touch with kind of these all these structures that are in place um so what's helped me to identify the principles, what's helped me do this is to identify the principles that matter most to me and use them as guideposts that I come back to again and again and again. Um, and they basically fall into five categories that I'm gonna share today and we're gonna just keep coming back to today and how you, um, how you think about these guideposts might be different. Maybe you have completely different guideposts, that's okay. I'm just gonna use these as a, a guide for us today. Um, and I, I hope that at least one of them, if not all of them, resonate with, with you. Um, but first, people before profits, right? Questioning this profit first uh, priorities and start exploring other ways, um, other more humanistic, uh, holistic alternatives in our business, um, in our business models. Um, sustainability, let me get that on there. There we go. Sustainability. So resisting practices that take 
undue advantage of workers or consumers or the environment or even just ignoring our own well-being for the sake of profit. We have someone in the waiting room. I'm going to let them in. Oh, great. Got in. Uh, wonderful. So um, also economic, economic justice, right? Championing for fair distribution of resources and opportunities within the business and just ensuring everyone has a chance to thrive. Um, all right, systemic change. So pursuing business practices that actually challenge and aim to transform oppressive systems and promote empowerment, equity, and justice. Community focused, so emphasizing our interdependence, cooperation, collaboration, right? That sense of we, that sense of community over competition. And then finally, rest, which is um, acknowledging rest as a radical act of resistance, um, which is absolutely crucial uh, to uh, our wellness and to, cap, uh, to counteracting capital, ca capitalism's harmful hustle culture, grind culture, all of that, right? And I used to call this self-care, and th this is where we get to that point that you were uh, mentioned in the chat, Mel, which I th think is so important. I used to call this self-care, but as that term has become more and more popular, I've really been struggling with how it's used, which is absolutely ignoring collective care, ignoring community care, and also promoting capitalist ideals. And so I, I, I'm always careful to use self-care without, as you did in the chat now, also mentioning community care or collective care. And I've been super inspired by the work of Trisha Hershey, and she actually has a new book that I adore called Rest is Resistance. Um, so I strongly recommend that, um, that there's a link to, to Trisha's website uh, in the workbook, which you'll get either by link or by email if you drop a, a message in a note to the chat, a private note in the chat with your email address to uh, the Banyan Wellness participant here, which Mel is there today. Um, but it's an incredible book and it really views rest as a form of resistance against capitalism and as a way to heal from just the physical and mental exhaustion that's caused by overwork and systemic oppression. Um, so these are the principles I use as my guideposts. I have absolutely not been perfect and it's not always easy. Um, so we're going to talk today or we're going to talk right now, actually, um, and just take a moment to reflect on how we can apply these principles. Uh, into our own lives and businesses um, and start to understand them, uh, how they fit into how we move forward and how we can move a make a positive impact. So I'm going to give some examples, actually, before we start with our own businesses. Let me get to my slide with some examples. I'm going to start with some examples. Um, and we were going to do this in breakout groups, but why don't we just do it all together? That's going to be pretty, pretty cool. All right. Um, let me think about which one I want to do together. Let's do um, let's do a holistic nutritionist, the holistic nutritionist. And the other examples are in the workbook, too, if you want to kind of explore them. So I'm going to give you a scenario, and then I just want you to give me some ideas on how that the holistic nutritionist can approach this, um, this situation with uh, the, those guideposts, those holistic guideposts in mind, the holistic business principles. So the scenario is this. So... The nutritionist has developed a nutrition plan and many clients with a very specific health condition have really benefited. The holistic nutritionist has seen amazing, amazing results for this particular health condition and they're, they're, the people they work with have really benefited from this. So they can get a patent on this nutrition plan and sell it at a, at a very high price, do very well for themselves financially, or they could make it freely available to the public. Um, so my question is twofold. I have two questions. So do you think they should do one or, over the other? And do you think there's anything else they might do? So I'm just going to put that out there. I see something in the chat already. Both. Do both. Nice. And what would that look like? What would that look like, Mal? Sorry, I'm cooking. Um, <laughs> so... Nutrition. <laughs> Nutrition. Um, so, you know, I, I think we all have to live, right? And as I stated to my story before, every time I went to school, it's been quite a big undertaking for me, um, whether it's raising money, um, fundraising to go back to school or taking loans. And so my earned income, I do deserve to be paid for 
the amount of work that I put in, the amount of education and ongoing education. But I always create an avenue that is accessible for all. And so that can be, you know, scholarships or outright um, gratis type of work. Um, and sometimes it's good faith. Sometimes it's sliding scale. It really depends on the material and the amount of time and money that I've had to put into it. So I don't think that there's a, a one, for me at least, I don't feel like there's a one, one certain pathway. I feel like it's both. And I mean, I live, we all, a lot of us live here in an absurdly wealthy um, area and the folks that can't afford to pay for it and it's not even a blip on them. Yeah. I want them to pay for it. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. And yeah, like acknowledging we need, we're operating in capital in a capitalist system for many of us, we can't get food, water, clothing, shelter through any other means, but with money, right? So acknowledging that reality, right? And making it possible for us to do that, that and take care of ourselves and to thrive and support our families if we need to, or our children or our community, right? We need money for that. And not at the detriment to others who, who also would benefit from what we offer. So I love that. Yeah. And then Heather, you also wrote hybrid combo. Do you have um, more, more thoughts around it? I was going to say really similar to what Melissa said. So not, um, no, but I do the same thing. It's like, have a, have a pricing that feels fair for anybody that can afford it. And then mostly behind the scenes that I will offer on an as needed basis, sliding scales, scholarships, um, and case by case work with people so that the people that need it get it, whether they pay full price or nothing, but it's got to be supported by somebody. So having a price and having some, you know, income or high ticket something for the people that can or have even corporations that have a lot of money is how the funds the whole thing. Yeah. I love that because really what what you're doing in essence and what you're talking about too, Mel, is like a redistribution of wealth, right? You're taking money from here and then benefiting, you know, all. So exactly. that's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, love it. Love it. All right. We have someone in the waiting room. I'm going to go ahead and admit them. All right. Yeah, beautiful. Awesome. All right, and I'm going to drop again into the chat um, a link to the workbook. And if you can't access that workbook, private message um, Banyan Wellness in the Zoom chat, your email address, and they will see that you get a copy of it. So great. Let's see. I'm going to check the time really fast. All right, we're going to keep moving forward. Um, but there are more of these examples in the, uh, or more of these scenarios in the workbook. So if you want to just kind of explore real challenges, you know, some of these are things I've actually heard people struggling with, um, exploring how can folks live in line with the holistic, business, some holistic business principles while facing some of these, um, uh, these quandaries. <laughs> oh, before uh, we move on, Ethel, yeah. um, just on some of the scenarios where it involves like, patents and rights ownerships and have you had some just like generalized approaches on those have you yeah seen that's a great question yeah that's a great question i mean sometimes like with like the patent situation and um, that one's actually a little bit tricky from a legal perspective because if you um, if something is patented and you give, you sell that patent, right, to someone else or you patent it yourself, you actually, um, there, there may be, I don't know if always, but there may be limitations as to how much you can just give away for free. Um, if you own the patent yourself, I don't think that there, that that's much, as much of a challenge. Um, but you can explore other avenues like collective ownership, right? Is that, a, is that a possibility? Or, um, is it a possibility to offer um, maybe like a basic version that's uh, free or cheap and then a more comprehensive version? Uh, maybe that includes, uh, you know, something else 
uh, for folks who can afford it. Or I love what what, what set people said in the group around having a kind of hybrid where you sell to folks who can afford it or sliding scale, um, so sliding scale it. Um, but yeah, there's not, I can't say anything like really specific on the legal end of it. Um, if that's what you're, if that's what you're curious about. Actually, I'm not a patent lawyer and that stuff is really complicated. <laughs> was that Candy? Did you ask, was that you Candy that asked that? Yeah, and I wasn't expecting you to go into patent law. It was just more like what you may have seen. Um, yeah. Yeah, mostly like a sliding scale type offering. Um, but yeah, I so appreciate that. I appreciate it. And then in the tech, in the tech world, right, that's real. Like, things around patents is, it's all about the patent, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> open source is what we, we go with. Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful. Exactly. I love it. In every space, folks are figuring out ways, right, to to democratize the offerings. I love that. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about um, our own wellness calling, right? So we've examined, we've talked a little bit about capitalist um, influences and perceptions of wellness and health and explored some holistic wellness principles. So we're gonna talk about um, the practice that you wanna create for yourself or the principles, you know, how you can bring them into your own life or your own business, whatever it may be. Um, and I very intentionally used um, this picture, this mycelial network. I'm, I'm super enamored right now with the mycelial network, which is this underground system that connects fungi and trees in a forest. And it's a way that nature exchanges resources and information and just like this network our wellness practices i would love for them to be promoting this interconnectedness and mutual support right the fungi as you can see are absolutely thriving in this forest and they thrive without taking more than they need to thrive right and then they ensure that the resources they can offer are distributed where they're needed most um, and it's just such a lovely metaphor for how I would love for all, to see all of us operate um, in life and in our wellness practices. And very different from capitalism, which it, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit. And I just want to remind folks, especially folks who came in um, after maybe they missed that conversation. But unlike capitalism, which values profit and competition um, and, and individualism um, as just opportunities to grow our bottom line, we can step out of that. Right, when we're running our own practice and see our practices as part of this, this vast network that plays an essential role in, in nurturing our own well-being so that we can thrive and also the well-being of all. So we're going to talk just a moment about healers. And, I'm, and this word actually is intentionally used here. So in a capitalist society, this word healers is used as a way to describe service providers, right? Service providers offering their services through market mechanisms as widely and as profitably as possible. Um, but if we look through history, we see that healers actually held a very sacred role in their communities, um, serving as conduits for wisdom and healing, ancestral knowledge, transformation, um, you know, and these are deeply rooted these, these um, the roles they play were deeply rooted in the holistic well-being of their communities and of, of the collective. And so today in a more contemporary framework, when we think about um, wellness practitioners, and if you have also been honored with the title of healer as well, we can think of ourselves as really community nurturers, right? And this is whether, you know, whether you have or don't have a business in a, this capitalist structure, just having the power to actively resist the commodification of these practices and recentering well-being, right? The well-being of the planet, the well-being of all beings um, and prioritizing equity and shared power and accessibility and honoring, as we talked about and Meg just so beautifully and eloquently discussed, honoring the historical and cultural roots and significance of the techniques um, that we share as wellness practitioners. Um, and so to do this, we have to start with um, exploring what you're going to be sharing with your own community. Uh, and I'm calling that here your wellness calling, right? So capitalism would ask the question, 
what wellness techniques have the the greatest potential for maximum profit like how can we strip away everything that we can just so that they can have mass market appeal and generate maximum growth right that's those are the questions capitalism asks asks of us um, but we're going to explore something really different we're going to explore how your passions your skills your values your interests can contribute to a wellness practice that nurtures the well-being for all people and I know some people, we're all on really different journeys here today. So some people might already know, like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to share yoga or, or um, you know, Reiki. These are the things, some of the things I share. And, you know, so many other things um, you might already know. Some folks, maybe not so sure. Some folks maybe aren't interested in o opening wellness uh, practices, but really just offering services. I just want you to think about kind of what you want to do with the the knowledge you take away from or the knowledge you have to share to your community um, what is it what is that and the questions i have here that we were going to explore together are what wellness techniques resonate with you or your values and what skills or talents do you have that could contribute to the wellness of others so um, I'm going to just be quiet for a few moments, let you all jot something down um, if you're taking notes or just thinking about it, if that's how you prefer to process these questions. Um, and I'll just give a few minutes of silence for that. I think there's, there might be some sample responses in the workbook. Um, if so, feel free to take a look at those as well. All right, and then I'm gonna put up the holistic business principles again for a moment. Um, hopefully you have some thoughts about what your wellness calling is. So with these being the holistic business principles, people before profits, sustainability, economic justice, systemic change, community focused and rest, I want you to start thinking about how you might be able to um, incorporate some of these into what you offer. And I'll, I'm, I put that up there for folks who didn't see it the first time. Um, and I'm going to offer some ideas for how this can actually be uh, incorporated into what you offer into any kind of practice. So some ideas might include um, that align with those business principles might include accessibility and affordability. Um, so making your products or services accessible to marginalized communities. And already um, Heather and Mel kind of touched on this with the scenario we played, right? Offering things sliding scale, discounts free to folks who might fight, face financial barriers to access. That's something to be thinking about. Um, centering community needs, right? So focusing on um, community needs and engagement by actively involving community members in shaping the services you offer, if that's practical or works with what you do. Um, hosting community events, workshops, you know, Banyan's nailed this beautifully, 
um, providing resources that address specific wellness concerns and challenges faced by marginalized communities, right? Thinking about what communities actually need. Um, thinking about radical education and healing, right? So incorporating educational com components that challenge oppressive systems and promote uh, healing from systemic trauma, right? Again, workshops, trainings that empower folks to, uh, with knowledge to navigate um, their own wellness journeys, uh, navigate oppressive systems and promote personal and collective liberation. Uh, you can think about collaborative partnerships, uh, building partnerships with other organizations and businesses that share similar views, collaborating on events, um, or you know projects that challenge oppressive systems or work toward our collective liberation. Um, other ideas, mutual aid and solidarity, right? Mutual aid initiatives and solidarity um, efforts with uh, other marginalized communities, maybe communities uh, that uh, include people whose identities you don't share, right? Just supporting um, and recognizing that we're all in this together, right? Uh, supporting grassroots movements, advocacy, activism, anything that works toward dismantling oppressive systems. So these are some ways. So um, yeah, so I'll just give you a minute to just kind of think about how might you um, imagine this calling uh, aligning with a holistic community-centered approach to wellness. And then I'll invite folks, if anyone wants to share anything, I'll invite folks to do that in just a minute. But for now, I'll just give you a couple minutes to think about this, this question. Hi. So uh, one of the things that I've been considering is um, teaching more. Um, I currently make body care products and something that I'm running into is packaging and getting it out to people. Um, and so I was considering just teaching so that way people can make it themselves and then I wouldn't need to worry so much about what it's going into and people can make that decision on their own after I educate them on why plastic is no good and things like that. Um, so that's sort of my community centered approach to sort of bring people together that are wanting all natural products and, and wanting to make it themselves so that way they don't have to rely so much on going out to the store and picking something up that is just riddled with garbage that we really don't need to be putting into our bodies, especially on our skin. So um, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I'm looking for is, are those people that are interested in that. I would totally go to that. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's such a beautiful way to be thinking about that especially because with um, the packaging question, right? If people are doing it themselves, then that's less packaging that even needs to be generated, right? Like I have jars at home that I, I don't have anything to put in them, but I don't want to throw them away because I know they're amazing. For, they, you know, it always comes up like, oh, I could use a jar for this, right? Exactly. So mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. Yeah, and I've considered even, you know, doing like a recycle program where people can like bring it back, but then I'm just like, then that's just more work for me of like cleaning and sanitizing. And I'm just like, we really can do this ourselves. It's not hard, you know? Beautiful. I love that. I love that. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, I th that makes me think of, oh, I would love for everyone to share what they do. And we'll do that in a minute. I just want people to start dropping stuff in the chat in a minute. But, um, <laughs> Because, you know, we're here. Let's support each other in our efforts. Yeah, anyone else? I'd love to share from folks. Anyone else have thoughts about how to align uh, your calling with a more holistic community-centered approach? I mean, I'm, I'll chime in. I'm constantly trying to figure out, like, more way. I'm always in my head about Banyan um how to streamline it but then beyond that in order for me to create banyan i had to step away from my private practice because it just wasn't there's not there's only one me 
And now as I'm starting to look back at uh, going back into private practice, using everything that I learned uh, before Banyan, when I first went into practice on my own and incorporating the things that I um, have learned with Banyan and still continue to learn. And for me, it was trying to meet the need of all the different people that wanted to work with me and creating healthy work-life balance um, to where I wasn't burned out. And then how do I reach more people um, especially when cases for my scope of practice could be so big and everybody's <clears throat> health journeys are very different, right? And the way that Hashimoto's may show up in one person looks slightly different than the other person and so on and so forth. Um, and so for me, as I'm coming back into private practice, it's thinking about a method. And for me, the method because just like with Banyan, I so strongly feel that the, the pillars of wellness are the, the key to, uh, to a personal healing uh, or recovery from illness or disease. Um, and so how do I do that where I can reach more people and they always walk away with sustainable tools? The sustainability part of it's big for me. And even when I work with clients, I'm like, I only work with you for the least amount of time that I'll work with the client is three months. And that's not because I want to keep you there. It's because that's a bare minimum. And I'll tell them, but the average that most people work with me is around nine months. My hope is that you don't need me after that. And that goes against typical business practices, right? Because, you know, I, I'm just, you know, on, on good grace that there'll be more people that come to me, but it's about creating a really ethical model that also um, stays within my scope of practice. So I'm not creating further division amongst uh, natural practices or natural medicine and Western or allopathic medicine. And so a way that I do that is make sure that, um, number one, I know what my lane is. I know my lived experience and my earned experience. And I make sure that my lived experience, that I'm buying into earned experience to further develop me with the knowledge of my lived experience. And then knowing that it takes multiple people. And so creating networks of uh, therapists, of, uh, you know, different types of doctors and creating a rapport so we can work with these folks and truly help them. We're not just passing them back and forth like here you're a diabetic and then you go to your doctor and they go eat better stress less and then they send you to this person and then this person you run out of money so you got to go to this person and then you don't even have money to deal with movement and it's trying to create those networks of trust i love that i love that i love the um like this understanding that there's really only well, not always, but oftentimes there's only one part that we want to hold, but how, but some people need a lot more. So how can we, as a community of wellness practitioners, how can we all work together to support all of us? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so much there, but that was one thing that really, really stood out for me. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Beautiful friends. I love it. There's, ah, when we get together, we have so much to offer each other. So please keep, like I said, jump in. If anything comes up, I love hearing from all of you. All right. So we're going to move into, um, let's, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about who folks want to serve. Um, we're going to take just like a quick breath together. Let's just take a nice deep breath together. Find a comfortable position for the body and just take in a deep inhalation. Take Fill up the lungs and completely empty the lungs. You can do two or three more slow, deep breaths if you'd like. In through the nose and out through the mouth or the nose.
as you're ready, allowing the breath to return to neutral. All right. And let's keep going. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. And you've all already touched, or those of you who've shared, have already touched a little bit on this question that I'm about to ask next on this next slide. But who do you want to serve? And so when I think about um, my journey in starting Attuned Living, I really struggled with this um, because the capitalist framing around this is um, um, the word that I often hear used is fine. It's a niche or niche, right? But the framing I so often heard was, um, you know, this segment of people who you want to serve. It's very important to identify a segment of people you want to serve, and it has to be a very profitable segment of the market, right? Um, who can you extract the most money from so that you can make the most money possible, so you can maximize your profits? And so I always resisted this idea of narrowing who I want to serve. Um, but what I've since learned is that it actually is really helpful for me because it allows me, it, it has been helpful for me because it allows me to um, focus my resources. Like, because like Mel said, I, there's only one of me. So it allowed me to focus my resources really narrowly on what direction basically I was pointing my message toward. And then of course, allowing anyone who was, um, who learned about what I do was welcome, of course but it helped me to really focus my efforts on serving a very specific community, or in some cases it might be addressing a very specific need. Um, it allowed me to provide really specialized care in that area and let people know that that specialized care was available for me. Um, and it also kind of creating this um, community, like this micro community, I guess, who I was focused toward also helped me build really meaningful relationships. Um, with the folks I was working with. So really prioritizing uh, quality over quantity, right? And really fostering this sense of community and trust among the people who I served. Um, and I feel like, I know Aika, you mentioned you have your new brick and mortar, which is amazing. So for you um, or for anyone who has like a physical space, that community might be a geographic community, right? That you're really focused toward, right? So having that kind of individual individualized care community support whether it's through a an identity or a challenge or a geographic location building meaningful connections when that all happens that really allows for there to be meaningful impact um, so getting really really clear on who you want to serve is going to inform absolutely every next step you take along the way of creating and sustaining your practice. And so again, it doesn't have to be like a group of people. It could be, a, uh, and we'll talk about this, but we're gonna start with identities. Actually, we are gonna start with identities. Like what identities um, do you yourself hold, right? So just, I'm gonna take you a moment to just think about the identities you yourself hold. And this is just for you. You're not gonna be asked to share any of this unless you want to. Um, I'll throw some ideas here up on the screen. Um, but in your notes, you know, this is not a comprehensive list. So whatever comes up for you. So it might include gender, class, age, race, sexual orientation, cultural background, any other identity that you may hold. Just think about that for a moment. And I'll just give you about a minute for that. All right, and then expanding out from that, right? Thinking about um, any other identities or traits or experiences, right? Might include personal relationships, job, job occupation, skills, values, hobbies, interests, social affiliations, personal beliefs, 
unique challenges or experiences. Let me think about some of those that might um, might come into play later. Who knows? Just an exploration. I'll give you another minute. Okay. And there might also be systemic issues, right? Systemic issues are really real for those of us who hold marginalized identities in particular. Um, and so those are also, um, uh, those might also apply to the folks you want to serve. And I'll say even if being, uh, um, before I go into these questions, actually, I'm going to put that back. You know, even if being a member of a marginalized identity isn't how you define the the group of people who you want to serve, you're still going to be operating in this society where systemic oppression exists, right? So you're going to be serving people who experience systemic oppression to some degree or another, on some level or another, even if it, that's not um, the, the focus of the um, uh, of how you identify the folks that you're really focused on serving. So just thinking about these questions, we were going to do this in small groups, but I'm going to just put all these questions up and let you contemplate them and maybe even offer some answers. So what has made wellness services inaccessible to those who need them the most? How have power structures and systems of oppression impacted the wellness of my community, meaning your own community? So questions to ask yourself. And then what systemic barriers or societal issues might folks who I wish to serve face. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to contemplate that. And if you want to offer them up out into the group, welcome to do that as well. Okay, and then the invitation really here is for you to think about the answers to some of these questions and think about how you might put this all together, right? You've explored your wellness calling, who you wish to serve, um, systemic issues that the people you want to serve may face. And now just start thinking about putting it all together, right? So, um, I'm, I'm really kind of blanking on whether or not I put this in the workbook or not, but for example, um, I'll put some examples up on the screen, right? Uh, a nutritionist, right? Might want to um, really be interested in organizing commuting, community cooking classes and nut nutrition workshops, particularly in underserved communities where access to healthy food may be limited, right? We, I know Oakland here, we have really intense food deserts where there's just not a, a, a real access to healthy food, right? So maybe the nutritionist is thinking about something like that, right? Working in um, communities and food deserts. Um, or a mental health, someone who wants to start a mental health initiative um, and get being more specific uh, for maybe transracial adopt adoptees. Um, and I'm just drawing from um, 
folks who I know and who do uh, things like this. Um, a friend of mine was really looking to create a safe space for uh, individuals in the LGBTQ plus community who are survivors of domestic violence. Um, and that's uh, somewhat geographically limited because it is a, a space where folks can actually go and get support. But they also like, again, to show you how this can like, even though that's the focus, they have resources that they can then send out to people everywhere who need this. So just starting to think about like, what can the focus be can be really, really helpful in terms of using your own resources, your personal resources, your time, your energy um, wisely, right? Because I'm, I'm a big supporter of rest. I'm a big supporter of rest and, and taking care of ourselves in this journey. And, you know, and I say that like there for me, I definitely find that there are ups and downs. Like there are times when I am in like that full, just like work, 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 no break. Um, I can't remember exactly how you said it, Mel, but you just said something like, I always have Banyan on the mind, right? And like, I get like that. I can be in that space and not only on the mind, but like in the body, in the work all the way. Um, but I also believe that rest is a key component um, in this journey for all of us. It certainly has been transformative for me. So um, especially as a wellness practitioner to take care of myself. And it's becoming, as I'm finding too, like as the years go on and I get older, it's becoming more and more important. So let's see. Um, so yeah, so take a moment. Um, actually, I'm going to let you all use the workbook for that. But I want you to be thinking about that um, and really like, dive into like how how specific starts to make sense for you and work for you and i'll save some time at the end for us to explore together if you have some ideas and thoughts um later if you have any now i'll open the space up for that too let me see something in the chat oh beautiful it looks like a great resource in the chat from mel thank you so much mel would, do you want to share what it just... is oh please go go Oh, she can speak to the link first if you want. You want to speak to the link first, Mel? That you dropped in the chat? No, it's just a. It's just a good. It. I, I thought about that article and I thought I would share because it's a, it's a, it's well written in my opinion. Be beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. I guess it's. A, I was just wondering about your process of getting specific and like if you. I don't know if that's already planned or like you've sort of mentioned it, but I don't know if there were any other things you'd be willing to share about kind of when you got specific with opening your, um, as you kind of like, cause it sounded like you started in a space of like, I don't wanna go to this capitalistic space of I only can serve these people or what have you. And that you actually saw the value in like conserving your resources and, and focusing specifically. So I wonder kind of where you ended up or where you are now, I guess, in that process of the specificity yeah. of your clientele. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I have my, like what I, my offerings, my direction has changed so much, but I can tell you how I started. So when I started with um, coaching, so I started out as a coach um, and that's pretty much all I was doing because although I was a yoga teacher, I was mostly just um, teaching through where I had learned as a volunteer. And so coaching was really my, my primary focus. Um, I started out just like, I will coach anyone. I can't remember what my really broad thing was. I think it was just like, I'm a life coach. I think that was just kind of where I started. I was just like, I'm a life coach, you know, come and see me. <laughs> And then I found I was really struggling with that. And I was actually also getting folks who wanted support in things I really um, wasn't particularly interested in. Like I, I didn't, they didn't grab me. So I actually narrowed that down to lawyers because I just come out, out of my legal career. I just stepped away from that. So I narrowed it down to lawyers who were unhappy in the law. <laughs> so I was like, that is so specific. And it's also me where I came from, my background in that time, very fresh off of that. And so I worked with people who maybe wanted to switch careers or maybe wanted to reinvigorate their, um, their interest and their love of what they were already doing if they wanted to stay as lawyers. So that's kind of how I narrowed that down. Um, 
you know, I also had this idea that um, because I knew so many lawyers, that would be, um, you know, kind of easier to find people. And it was, it was good. It was very helpful. Um, I, I, oh my gosh, I could go on and on. I will just say um, one interesting thing. Um, oh, let's see. I think my sound has changed. So hopefully, can you all still hear me? Um, I also realized I don't want to be in the legal space. Like after a while, I was just like, I don't want to just keep being surrounded by lawyers. Um, so that like launched a whole new, <laughs> like a whole new journey. Um, and now I would say my, um, what I really love doing is partnering with organizations like Banyan so that I can support folks who don't necessarily have to um, put out like give you know give a bunch of money to, to to benefit from the wellness services or whatever I'm offering in the particular moment. So right now that's kind of the direction I'm going, working with larger organizations or even smaller organizations, but that have their own audience that I can support where we're in alignment. Um, but that took that was like a lot of other steps to get from working with lawyers dissatisfied with their careers to that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for asking. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I, I was thinking I should write this down somewhere like that journey because it's been very um, not linear, <laughs> whatever the opposite of linear is. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you no, thank you for sharing that because yeah, I think I am in the space of like how specific is too specific or how <laughs> how broad is too broad and um especially as i'm looking to shift in careers and focus uh it can get confusing and to hear that like yeah it's not a linear process is very helpful and also like just knowing that like oh yeah one can also just make changes as they go along to what is best for them as it as it shifts in them personally as well is also important for me to remember yeah absolutely i mean i have friends in this space who were like clear from the beginning this is what i want to do this is the um these are the people i want to serve these are the communities i want to benefit from my work and they started that and 10 years later they are still doing the exact same thing that's one way <laughs> that was not my way so again, a million ways to get to where you're going. And I don't even feel like I've landed completely yet. You know, I think I kind of alluded at the beginning, I feel like it's starting to settle, um, but I'm still working out the details myself. So yeah, it doesn't have to be linear. You can change. Um, as someone, I'll say one thing, as someone like, which was really real for me, you know, from pretty young age, I was, I kind of became, uh, I kind of had this mind I was going to be a lawyer, right? So pretty young age, I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I said that for, you know, 20 years and I became a lawyer and I was a lawyer and it, it happened. And so when I left that and started this and I'm like, oh, like I'm over here and I'm over there. It was so uncomfortable for me. It was so uncomfortable to send yet another email to my friends and family. Oh, I'm going to try. I'm doing this now. I'm shifting slightly now. I'm you know, so that was learning for me. So that was real. You know, you might not have that discomfort, but for me, that's been a huge growing edge for me, like getting comfortable and telling people, you know what, I figured something out. I figured out a place where I can be more effective and I want and enjoy myself and be more um, powerful and more of service and I'm shifting. Right. So there's, there's, that was, that's been a practice for me. And I actually, I appreciate, I appreciate the growing in that. But it's real too, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Meg. I see that thumbs up. Appreciate it. All right. So okay, so now we're gonna get into kind of the unless folks, is there anything else anyone wants to share? Love to hear that. Hi. Hey. I just um I was thinking about how in 2008 when I told people I was gonna work with folks both their bodies and their minds, people were like, no, <laughs> you have to pick one or the other. And the irony of, I mean, clearly the world we live in now, I think folks have a better sense of there not being such a thing as compartmentalization, at least in a healthy space. So I'm only saying that because if you decide, I, I'm sharing an example, this is an example because I think if you decide 
you want to do something and people are naysayers, feel free to ignore them because <laughs> like really people were saying, you can't do that. You can't teach yoga and do executive coaching. And, you know, I was like, I'm not ready to define the, the age of the person because I don't think that's important. What I realized the way that's evolved because it's still evolved is that I want to work with people who see the process as part of what's interesting. Like the journey is as important as the goal. And that doesn't mean that you can't have high lofty goals. And it doesn't mean I'm not into efficiencies and effectiveness and optimization and excellence, but you have to like care and be interested in the fact that along the way it might suck or it might be wonderful, but you could grow. If you want to grow, I'm your gal. If you're, if you just want to like jump to the ends and reap all the benefits, I'm not the person to work with. And so that for me was what was, I guess I had, I distilled over time in working with people and the people who were frustrated with me and me with them <laughs> were the folks who were like, can we just get to me getting what I came here for, what I'm paying you for. Um, but anyway, yeah. So Meg, just something in what you asked made me think of that, especially again, people saying you can't do that as if the way that you see the world, you're the only person who sees it that way. That just didn't seem to be, I could believe that. I didn't believe it. So I didn't buy it. I love that. Absolutely. And, um, I just feel like each one of us is so unique and so beautiful. And there is something inside of us that only we can offer, right? Only we can offer this the way that we offer it. So getting to that point, right? Like recognizing like, yes, it's about the journey, right? The destination is important, but it's about the journey. And that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm meant to do. And that's who I want. I want to support people who are in that that way of thinking or open to exploring that way of thinking with me like yes like that could be it it doesn't have to be like you know you know women between the ages of 30 35 who were lawyers and who are now unhappy right it doesn't have to be like that that doesn't have to be what the community you want to serve look looks like so like find that's you know something we did i didn't i talked more about in the wellness calling like what can you just you offer but each one of us is such an amazing gift, right? Like, look at that and trust that even if, like you said, like people are saying like, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. Do it anyway, because they're probably wrong. They couldn't do it, but just because they couldn't do it doesn't mean you can. So go, go. Uh, yeah, I see Meg is also relating to that. Yeah, that, that feeling of wanting to work with people who wanna work through the process, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, love it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about kind of just these practicalities of, um, of a wellness practice and what I've found. Um, and hopefully after the break, we're gonna have a kind of a, a we're gonna have a 30 minute break soonish. Um, I might move spaces so you can actually see where my space is. Um, but when you start your practice, if you haven't started already, um, they're just gonna be like, you know, physical objects and services that you're gonna need to start your practice, right? Physical items and services. So for me, I needed, an, like when I was just coaching, I just needed an internet connection, a computer and phone. Um, I put on, I, ha I had a slide with all this. I'm going to just skip over that, but I put a quiet, comfortable place on that slide, but I actually didn't even need that because when I was first, first getting started, I was meeting people in cafes. Like I had a couple of local cafes that there was a little private area that I could sit in and I'd meet with clients there. Um, I needed some software um, and that was it. And I needed my certificate. I needed to be certified or I wanted to be certified. Coaching actually doesn't require certification. Um, but I wanted to be certified. I wanted to have that certification. Um, I put insurance on the slide. I did not have insurance at the start. Um, when I moved more into yoga work and energy work, I did end up getting insurance. Um, but really, that was all I had to start a computer, com uh, com uh, internet, computer phone, and some software. <laughs> That's what I needed. So you want to think about what you need 
um, in your practice. I also had a notebook seeing that picture. I did also have a notebook that I took notes in from my sessions and kept track of where I was with folks. Um, so you want to be clear on what the things are for your own practice, right? Um, but then in addition to that, if we're, as we operate in these, within these capitalist systems, which is what we're going to start talking about, kind of just like the I don't know what to call it, just like the logistics, I guess, of starting a business. There are some activities or requirements um, that you may wish to engage in, you may choose to not. I'm gonna go through them. So if you do choose to, I'll give you some information to get started with that. Um, but before I move on to that, any questions so far about where this is going or your experience on this exploration? All right, I'm gonna jump in. So I have in the workbook something called, that I call the startup checklist. It might be kind of like at the end of a bunch of these uh, these slides, but um, one is cho choosing a legal structure. So this can be really, really informal, but if we're taking in money, um, there are structures in place that tell us we need to tell somebody about that, namely the IRS. Um, and the legal structure really defines how the practice interacts in the wider economic system, right? And that includes how it manages financial tra transactions and tax responsibilities and liability issues. And all these are impacted by the choice of structure you make. Um, I'll talk about my structure in a moment, but there are a lot of different structures your business can take. And the structure you choose is totally up to you. Um, some considerations you want to think about when you choose your uh, your structure, um, including aligning it with your values, is that a business with a focus on maximizing profit and market share might choose a different structure than a business that has a focus on promoting equity and community well-being and sustainable practices. Not necessarily, but oftentimes, right? Um, so I knew for myself the values I was taking into consideration. Um, I had very little of a budget <laughs> when I was getting started. Um, so I opted for a sole proprietorship, um, which is a little bit less expensive for setting up. Um, and I opted also in addition to a sole proprietorship, I opted for getting a business name. Uh, attuned living, which I've mentioned, a fictitious business name, it's called. And I registered for a fictitious business name statement uh, in, in my city, in Oakland here. Um, it's also known as a DBA statement or doing business as statement, which just basically tells the government that sometimes when I get paid, it's eat, sell Hayward. Sometimes when I get paid, it's attuned living. And that's the same thing, right? Where it's all the same. Um, you can also just use your own personal name. You don't have to have a business name. Um, at the time that I chose to use Attuned Living, my thinking was I wanted something that really reflected the nature of the work I was doing because I was I felt like, well, Itzel Hayward, actually at the time, Itzel Berrio um, is a lawyer. And so if I just say like Itzel Berrio doing business, everyone is going to think it's law. I mean, like the everyone who are my friends and family. And I really wanted to make a stand. Like This is a different thing. Um, so practically speaking, my experience has been that it's had some pluses and minuses. Um, there's some money involved, right? Getting the fictitious business name statement took some money, um, some administrative work. Um, it also took me a long time to come up with that name because I wanted a name that I liked, of course, but I also wanted it to be available as a .com, which I thought was really important at the time. And like now, today, I don't think it's that is as important, but at the time in my mind, I really wanted it to be business name .com. Um, and I wanted it to be broad enough because I knew my journey wasn't gonna be linear. I wanted it to be, wanted it to be broad enough to give me some uh, flexibility in what I was offering. So I, I, liked attuned living at the time. I still like it, um, but there have been times in there where I felt like, oh, maybe I'm trying to work with like this organization that might feel uncomfortable. Like, what is attuned living? That's not like, what What does that mean? Or it doesn't resonate with them for some way. Um, I had some hesitation about that, but ultimately 
um, I really like it. And these are the organ, like the organizations I want to work with, see that name and go, yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, so I'm glad I did it. Uh, it's also had benefits. I felt like it gave my business a sense of legitimacy in some certain circumstances, um, particularly when I was doing business like partnerships with other businesses when we're doing partnerships it felt nice to have that um but for your business the choice is absolutely yours um oh and heather has a great a uh, bit of information here i always tell new business owners to think long term broadly when naming so that they're not pigeonholed unnecessarily exactly exactly i actually recently a little bit more recently started another separate business for a specific need, like someone needed legal help. So I created this other business called Barrio Hayward Law. And now I totally regret that because I'm absolutely pigeonholed unnecessarily with that, that like kind of side project. So yeah, great advice, Heather. Um, so choosing a legal structure, there are a million to choose from, or not a million, but there are many to choose from. And it influences not just kind of like the administrative administration and startup and how you show up um, like I was talking about it but it also can influence like your day-to-day -day operations your taxes how much of your personal assets are at risk I just grabbed this um, little table right from the SBA website the small business administration website I'm going to drop it in the chat here um, yeah crystal thinking of a new name yeah it's it's a very interesting process. <laughs> it took me a, a long time. Um, so uh, from that link, that's a great resource if you want to start learning more about um, different business structures. Like I said, I did the sole proprietorship. I've done a partnership. I haven't done any of the corporations. Um, uh, the B Corp is an interesting, relatively new structure um, for businesses that are geared toward um, uh, offering uh giving back to their communities i don't know a lot about it so i'm not going to say a lot but um it seems like a really interesting um structure uh i'm curious about this also oh it does have nonprofit. that's another structure that i'm really interested about i'm thinking about uh shifting attuned living into a nonprofit organization at some point um and one thing that's missing from here is a cooperative corporation or simply a cooperative a co-op which is a special form of corporation that puts the ownership and control of the corporation in the hands of the employees, right? Or the or the folks who work in the company, like we talked about my, the, the, the favorite uh, grocery store of many of us here, uh, Rainbow uh, Grocery is a cooperative. So that's another form of cooperation that um, isn't necessarily, that isn't on this chart. So, you know, things to think about. And Heather, I've been trying to learn about B Corps, just talk to a founder uh, for two hours about it and it's confusing yeah I did a little bit of research on it and then I I learned that there was also something in some states I don't know if California is one of them called a benefit corp which is not a b corp is like not to be confused with b corp anyway there are structures out there so check it out um that link hopefully that I dropped in the chat is a useful resource and um that's exactly what's confusing. Exactly. Benefit versus B. You would think B because the B Corp is about um, giving back and um, giving back to the community. You'd think it was that, but it is not. They're two different things. So yeah, check it out. Um, or just go with sole proprietorship to start if that feels like the way to go for you. That's what I did. So choosing a legal structure, opening a bank account, um, and when I say bank account, I don't necessarily mean at a bank. I actually opened mine at a credit union, and I like credit unions because they're typically member-owned not-for-profits that exist to serve their members rather than to maximize corporate profits. So if you're actually looking for loans, um, you, you can typically get better rates through um, a credit union. So I'm like a big proponent of credit unions. Um, some really aren't set up to have business accounts, so you do have to get a bit creative. My business account is with, um, my business bank account is with Patelco Credit Union, and um, they don't have business accounts. So what they have is something called a DBA account, the Doing Business As account, which is only for sole proprietors, um, and it's managed by uh, the credit union. So I had to speak, I actually had to go in and speak with a bank officer to get it approved, to bring in my a DBA fictitious business name statement 
um, and you know my identification and everything everything came in and then they opened up an account for me so a little bit um, a little bit confusing um, and oh here in the chat about the business structure what I found most helpful about speaking with someone about a B Corp is that I'm uh, if I'm not intending to have employees it won't work and my work wouldn't qualify yeah there's so I like I know virtually nothing <laughs> about most of those business structures definitely let B Corp or the benefit corp so yeah absolutely um, for so many wellness practitioners uh, simplest most common is a sole proprietorship at first um, and LLC when needed, which is either uh, or when income meets or exceeds 70,000 annually. Um, this is not a rule, just a ballpark suggestion based on cost paperwork or when there's a need for liability protection like lawsuits, etc. Definitely something to think about. A lot of things to think about that. Um, so again, big proponent of bank uh, credit unions over banks. I have a long history of working with with bank or actually like opposing bank practices uh, from my lawyer days, uh, predatory lending work, lots of stuff. So I have a lot of opinions about banks. Um, and most recently, my mother-in-law, um, who is, I, I wanna say 82, has become like a total activist. Um, she's involved with this organization called Third Act, which encourages people to take their money out of banks because despite the climate crisis, banks are still the are enormous funders of goal of coal and gas and oil companies so i could go on and on um but just something to think about when you're picking a financial institution um they often have membership requirements for example i think mine you have to be a california resident but there are a lot of the membership requirements are pretty um universal and not hard to get into so check out credit unions. Um, and again, opening a bank account for my business wasn't anything I did right away, but it did become important just for tracking finances and whatnot as I started growing. So nice to get that some of that stuff done early. Um, and then of course there's budgeting and finance. Um, super important. And this is really how you figure out how to make your business sustainable and how it can support you. I'm actually going to like skip over some of the slides I had with the nitty, like the details of this, like really kind of drilling in. Um, but there are a lot of, I want to, and I might go back if we have time, I'll go back. But there are a lot of ways you can get resources for your business that aren't necessarily monetary, right? I mean, we need the money. Um, for most of us, like I know I do, like my rent is paid in money. Um, that's my number one. Like, I feel like maybe I could grow food. Maybe I could, I can't get water. So my rent and utilities, money, I need cash. Um, but a lot of other things, there are other ways to get um, compensated. So bartering is really great, right? Exchanging goods or services directly with another business or even an individual, maybe you offer something to someone and they give you something in return, right? Like a graphic designer, um, my trade services, like wellness services. Um, uh, I know I know Heather well, so I know Heather is like the barter champion. Oh my goodness. Um, so bartering is super powerful. Um, and then there's also just gifting, right? Gift donations, right? We talked a little bit about buy nothing um Heather barter her tie it's true it's true we need to we have to like get out of the money system right as collectively for the survival of our us as a species and a planet so yes barter or die I stand behind that um and then yes with trade or barter one still needs to track and report to IRS as income that you know uh I will say this I will say absolutely track very very um carefully you know if you barter or trade the date the person the hours and what was given or traded i don't know about the reporting requirements but there are some kind of reporting requirements around that so look into that um, but definitely at least now before between now and april 15th if you do any of that yes track that absolutely um you can do uh partnerships and collaborations of course um there are also time banks which i love that's how i got started when I was getting uh, my uh, certification as a coach, I needed to get um, like hours of practice for my certification. 
And I did it through time bank. So I let people, because I didn't want to do it for completely nothing because it, um, this kind of the psychology in this coaching school I went to was like, you need to get something for people to take it seriously. But I really didn't believe that that something had to be money. So I, I did time banks where I paid in with time, my time offering what I was good at. And then people paid me with their time um, and hired me as their coach. And it was like a, an exchange of hours. So there was a tracking software and you're like, here's one hour into the community. Now I'm going to take an hour from the community. So it was very cool. So time banks, a cool way to do it. Um, I can't remember the the URL. I used to know it by heart, but it's SF Time Bank here in the Bay Area. Um, and oh, thank you, Heather offered a, a little bit more information about bartering. Um, there's a non contact non contractual collaborating can be a barter too. just working together in mutually beneficial ways with no compensation that's being reported. So lots to think about with all this right like what needs to be reported what doesn't a um, lot of details so. Uh, yeah so track but track everything just track everything and then at the end of the year, you can figure out you know speak to someone who is way more knowledgeable about a lot of these details. Um, or we can all come together again and do a knowledge share I would love that uh, to figure out what actually to report. Um, well, I'll say a little bit. I'll go do a little bit of these financial slides, and then I want to I want to let you all go on a break. Um, so I have this slide in the workbook on resource planning, which like basically just says the money or the value right that you receive should exceed what you're putting out to make your business sustainable. Right. That's like the just like the in a, in a nutshell. Um, so looking at income sources, which is often going to be fees for your services, but not necessarily. That's not the only way, but that's often the primary way. Um, you want to look at what your fixed costs are. So these are the costs that um, you have to pay regardless of whether you have clients or not, right? Like if you have a brick and mortar space, if you have one client, if you have a thousand clients or one student or a thousand students, that price stays the same. That doesn't change. Um, and then there are also variable expenses. So that does vary depending on how many folks you serve, right? So again, if you have a brick and mortar space, if you have less people, you're going to have less perhaps cleaning or wear and tear on the space, right? So that's going to be a variable expense. So, uh, or if you sell products, right? If you sell products, the more you sell, actually, there's a price that changes, right? Uh, packaging, we talked a little bit about, or, or creation, right? That's going to change. Um, the, the raw materials you need, that's going to change. So being aware of uh, variable expenses. Um, and then there's one time expenses. So that's like the startup costs, um, which we'll talk a little tiny bit about. Um, and then you just want that to balance out. Well, when it's like zero to zero, when you're taking in as much as you're putting out, that's called your break even point. So you want to work your business toward getting to that point um, where you're not you're putting out and receiving the same amount and I love I love thinking of that in terms of not just cash but energy as well right that you're not just outputting and not also replenishing your own energy. Um, some ways to get startup capital i'm just going to go really quickly on this um, Community contributors part time work loans borrowing from friends and family um, peer to peer borrowing platforms crowdfunding, community funding platforms, lots of ways to get that startup capital. Um, and we could talk about that more um, after the break if folks are interested in exploring that more. And then kind of along these same lines of, um, of uh, budget and finance is just keeping track of everything. So you need to keep track of that. So keeping great records. I just started with an Excel spreadsheet to start and that worked great for me. Um, if that works for you, fantastic. If you want software, there's tons of great software. Um, uh, a lot of people like QuickBooks. Um, I, I don't use QuickBooks. I have a, I still use a spreadsheet basically, but I also now have an invoicing system. So that helps me track actually the 
the income, but I still basically just track my expenses in a spreadsheet, like what I spent, the output. And then we're going to talk about, um, I think after the break, we're going to talk about um, marketing. Marketing, which I think of as sharing your message, right? So we'll, we'll pause here. Actually, let me pause for questions first before we, before we split. Anyone have any questions? I'm going through these kind of fast. This may seem like a strange question, but do you think people like QuickBooks or they just use QuickBooks because it's so widely known? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I've heard people actually say they like it, that it's pretty simple. I believe there must be, based on how I've heard people talk about it, I think there are tiers. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I've talked to anyone who uses like the maximum features tier, mm -hmm. but I think people like it. And I know I use um, uh, TurboTax at the end of the year, and I know that it's um, like, it kind of works seamlessly with with it is it quicken mm -hmm. or quickbooks i can't remember which one now and so every year when i do taxes i'm like oh should i do that um <laughs> so <laughs> there are definitely benefits um but I, I do think some people do like it um heather says i know people like the quickbooks online nice um oh and heather's trying to remember the other really helpful tracking software her husband just set her up on awesome well when if you find that um definitely share that yeah i'm curious because I'm still Thanks. very just like piece it together. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking that. It's a great question. Um, all right, so we're going to move into marketing and networking uh, again, which I think of as just sharing our message, letting people know what we do, which we which we which can be really helpful, which we need to do at some level. Someone needs to know what we do. Um, so during the break, um, I think we promised 30 minutes. So during the 30 minute break, I want you to just notice the ways people get their message to you. So maybe you hop on social media during your break and you're scrolling through social media and you see ads. I want you to just notice that. Or if you eat something in a package, notice how they're talking to you about what they do or what they want you to do next with their products. So we'll take 30 minutes. So um, 145, 147. I'll see you back in 147. Sound good? And I'll be around. So my video will be off, but I'm here. So if you speak, I'll hear you. So all right, friends, we'll see you in 30. Can you pause the um, recording because you're in charge of it now? I sure can. Let's see. Uh, let's pausing share. Let's see. You want to pop it back over to me? Yeah, let me stop the share too. That might help. All right, I put this slide back up um, by request. So let's get back to where we left off so i'm going to go into marketing and this is such a big topic um and i really like talking about it i think because it's probably where i have learned so much i feel like i've learned so much about this topic um and oh and i also want to draw attention to the chat where heather dropped in the um tracking software that she loves and it's called tiller so that's in the chat there and it automatically sucks data out of your bank accounts slash debit cards slash etc and puts it into a spreadsheet for you. Uh, uh, let's see as a way to start working with the data. Oh, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, you know, and I'll say actually to that I'm going to go back to the checklist here um, to that end. Um, my credit card company actually if I just if I want to download my data at the end of the year, I, I can actually just download it as a spreadsheet, which isn't as great as this because that's automatic and it's only one, you know that's all your accounts and this is just my credit card but that's been super helpful for me at the end of the year and I think it has limits on how much data you can take down so I think I do it in either four or six month chunks I can't remember but you can get it all. Um, so yeah that's really helpful just getting it in a spreadsheet one way or another. So with marketing, I hope you took some opportunity to um, 
kind of notice what you noticed to take a look at things, but I want to talk about the values we can further with our marketing. Um, because this is such an important area and I've learned so much, especially from being on social media. Um, I get a lot of um, ads for teaching small business owners how to market. And there are people, most of the ads I get are not people who are totally aligned with my values. So I just wanna share the values that I really support um, furthering with marketing. Um, so, Transparency and honesty, of course, honesty, I think that probably goes without saying. Um, let me change my settings here on something. Um, okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot I can say about this. Um, one, you know, I'll talk about one ad that I get a, quite a bit and it's actually not, it has nothing to do with marketing. It's a course that I'm really kind of interested in about photography. And I get it's the ads for it pretty regularly and it says, you know, act now 80% off um, limited time offer and when you click on through the link, it has a countdown timer. You know that says this offer expires and I think it's like hours it's like eight hour countdown timer or something like that. And I've been getting the same ad for months and every time I go to the ad it's the same eight hour countdown timer so. It actually has put me off a little bit off of this course because I don't um, I don't want to support kind of that kind of marketing. Um, yeah, Heather knows what I'm talking about. I hate those scarcity tactics. Yeah, it's playing into scarcity and um, kind of the human impulse of like, oh, you know, I have this opportunity. I have to take it. Um, it feels like very like. Um, uh, like under like not cognitive like not front brain thinking but just kind of like oh fear based marketing yeah FOMO fear of missing out yeah. So transparent transparency and honesty that's really important to me um, it's why I wanted to give a, a lot more about my background as I went into this, because I want you to know like who who I am what what lens i'm looking at this work what my experiences are. Um, so it's a big one for me um, interdependence and Community orientation so really moving away from fear based or this is your only chance or this is a transactional relationship that we have but actually building real relationships so prioritizing community engagement and collaboration and long term relationships over quick sales. Um, respecting the autonomy and intelligence of your potential clients, you know, um, you know I think about that ad again it's like do they not. Like, do they not have enough respect for me to know I could go back to this website in a week and still see the countdown timer starting at eight hours right so like and I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to talk bad about this company and it's actually why I'm not mentioning the name or even what they sell. Because um, they're on their own journey right they're on their own journey, um, but I know that for me where I am in my journey that's not those are not the tactics I want to I want to employ. Um, promoting uh, and, and promoting equity and accessibility right so um, I really try and it's a learning edge for me, uh, making sure that my method messaging and out, outreach methods are accessible to all people all the people who I want to serve so um, i'm pretty good at not great but pretty good at. Um, captions for my videos that's so important to me um, for accessibility for a lot of reasons, not only for folks who are deaf and hard of hearing, but also just sometimes people don't want to hear the video or they don't want to hear the audio. They just want to um, read the words on the screen. So that matters to me. Growing edge for me are um, uh, alternative text image descriptions for my images. That's more of a growing edge for me, especially on Instagram. I love doing it when I remember, but I remember maybe one out of 15 times because um, I think of Instagram, I, I don't have the the education in that like I need to make it a habit and build the muscle. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, I feel so seen. Yeah, growing edge for me to the image descriptions working on it. Same. Um, and then, yeah, and then Heather with the, the timing. Yeah, deadlines do work and can be important. And sometimes they're real, like something is really going to run out. Once you sell out, it really is gone forever, but they don't need to be fake manufactured. Exactly. Like this recurring eight hour deadline. Exactly. Exactly. So these are the values I really try to further in my marketing. Um, 
And so we're going to just talk about how you can let people know about what you're doing. Um, and that's really what I see as marketing, just telling people what you're doing so that people know there's a million ways to do this. Um, I have, I think like 10 or 11 here that I'm going to just go through pretty quickly. Um, but we will talk a little bit more deeply about the ones that I actually use and I'm happy to answer any questions, um, that come up for you. Um, so there's direct communication, right? That's actually reaching out to folks and telling them what you do. Um, it can be phone calls, it can be emails, it can be text, in-person meetings, whatever it is, engaging in direct communication, in communication, communication, meaningful conversations, um, and dialoguing with people. Um, and all of these are really gonna depend what you choose to do. I'll say this too, what you choose to do um, is gonna depend on a few things. But again, if you know exactly who you wanna serve, it's super helpful because you know um, you might have a better sense of how to reach them, right? Um, if you are, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now and then we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but if you have uh, really strong interpersonal skills, persistence, um, you love having that one-to-one -one communication, this might be the way you go, right? And all of these like different strengths are gonna serve you as well, like what strengths you have, um, but also who you wanna serve. And and with this, start small with marketing, just getting the word out, start small. You don't have to do everything every time from the start. I like to think of like doing one thing, systematizing it. Um, and then once it's just like on a regular natural flow, maybe adding on another thing. Uh, another thing is building community connections, right? Um, working with um, uh, individuals, like-minded individuals, or folks who you could work with, you could collaborate with, a mutual support, collective empowerment. Um, that's a great way to do it. Um, that This could include like networking events where people who uh, you think would benefit from your services or who you could collaborate with uh, would be uh, things like that. Um, word of mouth. So someone knows what you do and you, uh, and then they spread the word for you. Um, that's a great way. Of, um, of of spreading the word. Um, that one's a little bit harder when you're just getting started because it's easier when you have satisfied customers so that they can do it because that's what it takes really satisfied customers, but still can be done. And if you have friends who are willing to do that for you, it's a great, great way of getting the word out. Um, knowledge shares, public speaking, speaking at events, uh, hosting webinars, great way to get the word out. Writing and creating content. Um, maybe writing's not your thing, maybe, and maybe you have a really visual uh, service. It could be pictures, right? Whatever the content may be. Uh, along those lines, social media, online marketing, um, that's another way you can get the word out. Uh, community outreach. So getting media coverage, press mentions, um, you know, local newspapers or TV show channels, right? These are totally accessible. Even when you're getting started, if you, um, like, especially if you have really good storytelling skills. Um, I was just on a webinar that Heather hosted actually, and someone was talking about, um, what were they talking about? They got some press. I think it was through a blogger. If I if I don't remember the exact story, go ahead and speak it out. And got huge publicity that way. Um, that was probably more of a. It wasn't really a strategic alliance. It really was like kind of a press coverage because they didn't do it intentionally. But you can form partnerships or collaborations uh, intentionally. Uh, that was um, oh, yeah. that was through Haro. That's Haro. what it, that's what it was. That's what I wanted to say. Yes, tell tell them about Haro. HARO is incredible. It's just a free platform. Um, HARO is an acronym that stands for help a reporter out. And you can sign up as a source with your area of expertise and you can just subscribe to all of the, the, the inquiries. And then they just get dumped into your email at certain times throughout the day, every single day. And it can be, you know, just something you you trickle through when you have time, but you scroll through the offerings that are coming from all, all over the country. 
And if you feel like your expertise, you can speak to one of them, you can submit a pitch. And so you can be quoted as a source in all kinds of things like journals, newspapers, blogs. Um, the example that you're mentioning, she actually makes a product and it was put into a Mother's Day gift guide in a blog. And two years later, that blog got quoted and the gift guide got spread and went viral and she got like 2000 orders. So amazing. Yeah, that's right. That's why I was thinking of her. I couldn't remember why I was even thinking about that help a reporter out. So that's a way to get um, that kind of um, media coverage, even when you're brand new. And in fact, I'm so glad you remembered Heather, because that was one of the very first things when I was first starting to finally incorporate yoga into my offerings. That was one of the very first ways I got my word out. I actually connected with someone on Haro who wanted an expert on wellness. And I should look it up. I'm sure that it's you know on the internet somewhere. Um, and someone wrote an article. I think it was even it was even maybe about me, not just me even quoting it. Um, and it's amazing. Yeah, Heather dropped the link in the chat. Um, such an awesome way to get into the press and being brand new. It's exactly what happened to me. Um, so strategic alliances, forming partnerships um, with organizations, I'll say like even um, uh, working with Banyan is, has been an amazing strategic alliance. And I'll talk about how that came to be, um, but that can happen. Um, you know, you can find those organizations that you can partner with and collaborate with. And um, that's a great way to get the word out. Uh, there's advertising um that is more um of a that typically requires more of a financial outlay but that's a way to get the word out definitely um and then just having an online presence such as a website i actually i'm finding this to be less powerful as a way to get the word out more powerful as a way to direct people to learn about me so I'm already talking to the person and there's a direct communication and then I say hey check out my website. Um, that's how I find my website more useful these days, but you may find the website helpful, especially if you are really you have like really great technical skills and uh, related to. Um, search engine optimization which helps to move results in search engines up to the top of the page. Um, or even onto the first page, you know, people talk often about um, being on the first page of Google, like that's the place you want to be if that's the way you want to go about it and you have those technical skills and um, that's helpful. Um, so let's see. Okay, so about Haro in the chat sign up as a source. It's free. Yeah, that's totally free. So you can get press coverage absolutely free. Um, and then a website. Yeah, destination point and a way to capture leads and people's into a, into a mailing list. Yeah. So a way you can use a website. So I'm just gonna leave this up for a minute um, to, for you to take a look at, maybe jot some notes, maybe think about uh, what you do wanna do, what you don't wanna do, and also open it up for any questions if folks have questions about these. And we're, I'm gonna go into a little more detail about each of these too. All right, so I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about some of the things I've done um, and that I've, what I've learned, <laughs> a little bit of what I've learned and I've been, I've changed, right? So the first thing I did when I started my business was get a website. I, you know, I mentioned at the start, I really wanted something I could get businessname.com because I was gonna make a website. That's what I wanted to do. And it's definitely gotten bigger and more sophisticated and I can do all kinds of things on it now, but I'm seriously, seriously considering replacing it with something super simple like that. Um, and that just links to other things. So 
this is actually, I'm pretty sure this is up right now, just like this. Um, through, oh yeah, I have the URL in my notes. Let me grab it. If you want to take a look at it, and it's actually through um, an app that I use that I actually really love, um, and I'll talk about it um, in a minute. Um, or maybe I'll just, I'll talk about it now, because I can't remember if maybe I went past that slide already. Um, but it's called Pocket Suite. And <laughs> I've known Heather for a lot of years, so she knows from like the day I signed up for it, I think, um, which was probably close to seven years ago now. Um, and it's uh, it's founded and the CEO is a black woman who I've since met over these years. Like I was one of the like first, like the first wave of, of people that used it. And I love it because it does invoicing and scheduling and um, it can make me this little page like this. I would still probably keep attunedliving.com and then it would redirect to that. Um, it does uh, so much text. I can text, I have a business number through it. I'm gonna give you my number at the end of the day. It's through them. So I love it. Um, I, can, I, I can share a referral link for you later. I think it gets you a discount. I'll check on that. Um, but the one thing I can't do on it, if you're into having a blog, I can't have a blog. And a blog is basically just a type of website, or it could be a page on your website um, that's updated regularly with new entries. It's like almost like an online diary if you're not familiar. Um, and you can have a blog section in your website where you share stories and information. Both are relatively inexpensive to set up if you want to get started. If you want to learn basic search engine optimization, you can. I never have, but I understand that if you write a lot of content with the material that's related to your topic that will increase um, that'll kind of move you up in search engines so something to think about if you want to explore kind of learning some basic search engine optimization if that's the way you want to go um, certainly where i started um, and then social media uh, i use um, and yeah some of the I, I have such a like a, a push pull relationship with social media, but it's an amazing way to connect with people, you know. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I want to use it exactly, but right now I think I have a, I, I mean, of course, I know I have a Facebook, Instagram, um, and I don't really use Messenger. These are just some of the most po popular platforms. I don't really use TikTok. I have a Twitter. I'm not really using it. Um, the benefit of social media is easy and there's no fee to set it up um and i i i had free on there first and then i changed it to no fee because it's not free it costs our time and attention and those are really valuable resources so being mindful of that um and then also there's like a side to social media that i really that are really challenged with right there are some ways that it's not aligned with my values um and I just have been increasingly critical of social media, especially around issues of data privacy and um, the really, I think, inadequate response to the impact it's having on mental health, especially on, on children and our young people, um, how it's been used in politics and uh, political manipulation and it's promotion for, in my feed anyway, it's promotion of grind culture, you know, because I get these, I get ads that are literally like, yeah, grind culture, like, let's do this. I'm like, no. Um, and then, you know, how it it has really a tendency to reward kind of this, um, this image, rather than going deeper, like, that's the whole point. It's just like quick sound bites, beautiful pictures, um, you know, so I'm challenged with it. Um, but I think it's really powerful for community building, you know, and this is actually how I met Heather. Heather's met an amazing, created, excuse me, an amazing community online of um, mom owned businesses, right? Like so awesome through a larger community, which she also built of moms in the Bay Area, the mama hood, and then the mom owned businesses are the club. And I, I mentioned there are only three Facebook, there are only three reasons I'm on Facebook, and that's the third one. Um, so community building is so powerful. Um, you can have, um, I'll put my little, I got my, my points here, um, value-based communication, right? Communicating my values, sharing knowledge, engaging with current events and social issues. 
Um, it can be used as a tool for transparency about business practices, about um, beliefs and values. Um, you can invite feedback, hold businesses accountable, right? We see that a lot. I know I've done that actually, holding businesses accountable and holding my own um, business accountable for its stated values and commitments, right? Like I can't be on Instagram, you know, posting 10 posts a day and five stories a day and 17 reels a day if I'm saying like, hey, we need to rest, right? That's, it helps hold me accountable in, in a lot of ways. That's just one example. Um, I love the equitable engagement, right? Like everyone can have a voice and I can, I try to use it in a way that respects um, my time and attention and the time and attention of people who are following me or who are looking at what I have to do. Um, and then also critical engagement as well, right? Critiquing harmful business practices, challenging the status quo, advocating for systemic change, all these things um, are really important to me about social media. And I expect I'm gonna continue to use it. I wanna kind of like do what I just said with you all, like systematize one and then just go have something kind of going before I move on to another or maybe just stay with one. Um, but I just wanna continue to do it more and more mindfully and intentionally. And yeah, Heather, uh, thanks for the kind words about the momhood and the club, doing what we can to support and uplift women in accessible ways. Yeah, beautiful, I love it. Um, so there's so many platforms, right? There are Snapchat, LinkedIn, um, Reddit. You can think about platforms that are also almost like search engines like Pinterest and YouTube, right? Don't do them all, <laughs> that's my only advice. Pick one, start, and then when you're ready to, when you feel like you got that humming along, if you want another, pick another. But I would say my mistake definitely was just like, I got on immediately like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the minute like Snapchat became a thing, I got um, attuned living. The minute TikTok became a thing, I got attuned living, but I haven't done anything on those platforms at all. I have Pinterest, attuned living on Pinterest, like I get them all, LinkedIn. Um, but I'm not really doing anything. Um, but yeah, even still just starting with the three Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, I was it was too much too much. So just get grab your name if you want. Um, but I would say just like do one at a time as you actually start getting involved. Exist on platforms that feel relevant, but focus on one. Yeah, exactly. And then when you feel solid on one and want to fold in a second. Exactly. Yeah, like on LinkedIn, I have a whole like attuned living page and it's there and it points to where I actually am like on my website or, um, you know, you know, contact me here, but I don't do anything on it because it's just a little bit too much for me right now. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I mean, there's so much we could say about this. Does anyone have any questions about, I mean, I just kind of talked about website and social media, but any marketing questions or outreach or sharing your message questions. All right, so we'll keep going. I'm just gonna keep moving down this checklist. Um, so that's something to think about, sharing your message. Gotta get, people need to know what you're doing to, to, so to pro provide them the, the support that you can and build community, right? It's all about community. Um, outsourcing skills. This is huge. Um, getting support in those areas that um, you're not strong at is great if you can. Uh, for me, trade is has been super, super helpful. Um, yeah, so I mentioned uh, the Mama Hood in the club. That's how I can, and I mentioned I would tell you how I came into partnership with Banny, and it was through the Mama Hood in the club. So I got that um, that ability to make that um, that partnership, which was beautiful through the club. And then outsourcing skills also super helpful to have a community. I hired a club member to design my logo and my business cards, and this is like a weak area for me. Oh my gosh, it's such a weak area for me. I do not have those skills. So if anyone wants to barter <laughs> with graphic design skills, I have all the brand whatever colors and whatnot and a logo, but it's my weak spot. Um, so outsourcing, finding people who can do what you can't um, and that you maybe don't have the um, time to learn or interest to learn. Like for me, I think with graphic design, it's time. Like I think to be good would take me so long. Um, 
but there are things that I was willing to learn. You know, I was willing to learn different social media platforms and jump on there. I was willing to learn a lot about uh, spreading the word about my message. Um, and so I did that myself. And when you get started, you become an expert at a whole lot of things that it are not what you're providing to your clients or to, to your community. Um, but you don't have to do it all. So outsource, outsource as much as you can. And trade is great. Finding communities of uh, business owners is great. Um, and then of course, um, if you can't barter, paying, paying a fair wage for their work. And that might be going beyond the market rate if that rate doesn't reflect the real value of their labor. And I always um, put in a plug for working with other small uh, local or independent businesses that share your values which not only supports your local economy, but also supports a larger network, right, of businesses who are promoting these same values. So again, just going back to those principles we started with, right, like keeping that at top of mind every step of the way. Um, and one more thing about this too, I'll say, it's just becoming easier and easier to find people from anywhere in the world, right? And they, they can charge really affordable rates. I've used um, Fiverr.com and uh, Upwork.com, and I've had some really great experiences. Um, but I'm really, I'm really, really mindful when I do that, right? Like I really wanna make sure that I'm paying a fair wage. Um, I'm, re I'm respecting their labor and skills. Um, I'm also really mindful of labor, of um, working conditions and labor laws in different places. Um, so I tend to work with individuals rather than corporations in other countries if I'm not familiar with like their labor laws and, and human rights laws and working conditions and whatnot. Um, and that, I mean, that's not only internationally, of course, like oof, providers in the United States um, want to be mindful of that as well, right? But I'm just mentioning other countries because sometimes we not, might not know. So always doing research on that, I do that. Um, and also being really mindful of the political climate in these countries um, and making sure that I'm not uh, um, supporting, you know, oppressive governments or, uh, or problematic human rights records. <laughs> it feels so um, fun, not funny, tragic um, to talk about human rights records because the United States has one of the most abysmal human rights records, right? So. Um, always be mindful of that. Like, I'm not trying to put this on other countries. Definitely, they are not alone. We're right in there with them in the United States. Um, but just always educating myself um, and trying in every decision I make to consider whether it aligns with my values and principles. Um, and then, and not just on this topic, um, I'll just say, you know, none of us like is perfect. Like I said, I've made mistakes. Um, and sometimes we have to do things that don't feel 100% um, aligned, like, you know, paying taxes. I don't like the, the amount of money that our government spends on military is horrifying to me. And yet I make the choice to pay my taxes. Um, and so when we make these kinds of decisions, just being really intentional and making them with critical thought and doing whatever you can to minimize harm and maximize um, alignment. Um, is really, uh, I think, what it's all about. So, all right. Any questions, critiques, comments? I'm super open and curious and interested in where people are all with all of this. I just had, like, I think about the general idea of marketing, and I I definitely understand like, yes, it's you just telling people so people know what you can do and offer them, but it goes into this icky feeling of like selling <laughs> that I just feel somehow uncomfortable with even still, like it just seems like it's a really fine line, especially for like health or wellness industry professionals, I guess, I guess, as I mentioned earlier, like I just, I know the toxic element or I mean, and it's inherent in capitalism, like there's the selling that is telling you that there's something wrong with you and that's it's like marketing technique and i i think that that i think is maybe my ethical <laughs> where i get stuckness you know like yeah yeah i i so appreciate that too i i really appreciate that and i struggle with that 
And I've, you know, I've slipped into, I wish I could think of examples, but I've definitely slipped into like where I'm doing something. I'm like, oh, this just feels so uncomfortable. Um, and so I, for me, I've really worked super hard to reframe it and not to reframe the same behaviors because I'm not trying to perpetuate those kinds of behaviors. Like you're talking about like selling or trying to convince people that they're less than if they don't buy what I'm selling, right? Like there, there's so much of that in marketing and it's, um, and or based in fear, like, oh, you, you know, you won't be enough or you're not enough unless you buy what I'm selling. Um, so yeah, and I like, I struggle even calling it marketing. That's why I kind of keep trying to lean toward um, letting people know what you do, sharing, spreading the word about what you do. Um, because that's really the perspective I take on it. And when I'm in that space, like I have something to offer that I really think is a contribution to my community. When I'm in that space, it's so much easier for me to say, hey, I also have this, you know, and, um, and then doing it in a way that feels most comfortable for me. So I don't feel um, there's some methods and I don't want to, you know, uh, criticize any of those methods. I think they can all be done well. I think they can all be done unethically, right? Um, so just finding the one that feels most comfortable and that is in alignment, right? Like that really is coming from this deep belief that what I have, one, I matter. I am, there's no one like me. There's no one who can offer what I offer the way I offer it. And I believe that there's someone that I can touch in my own unique way. And I wanna share that. I wanna share that with you. Um, if I come from that place, it's, Oh, it feels it feels joyful, <laughs> right? It feels joyful. And so finding w what's the space in which it feels joyful for you and then share your message. Yeah, thank you so much. I see a lot of stuff coming in the chat too. And I saw I saw an, someone unmute. Now I can't find. Oh, there we go. I, I can, yeah, go for it. So I spent however long as a recruiter. And in some ways, I think of this as the same uh, or a similar kind of thing. I also will say I spent like 20 years in retail, so I'm not an anti-sales in and of itself. Um, I don't come from that perspective. I, I always said, if you want an honest opinion about how you look in something, then come to me because I'm going to tell you the truth. And I think it has more to do with that, like the kind of salesperson. But when I think about recruiting, I was, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of equating marketing oneself to the activity of marketing yourself in a potential employer situation if you don't tell anybody they don't know like they're just not they're not in your head they weren't there <laughs> when it happens like they won't know your greatness and hopefully this won't rub folks the wrong way but there are moments where I'm like what would a straight white man do in this situation and then how do I translate that into who I am so that I'm not underplaying or underscoring what it is that I have to share or the same in talking about other people who have amazing things to share. Like it, it, it matters when people have the option of even if I just use Excel yourself or myself, like you walk into a room and the yoga teacher looks like you, like that matters. So people got to know that they have that option or else they opt out of things that we know they could benefit from. And it's not, I, I don't, mean to even talk about this from the vantage point of like moving into savior complex or something but I do think it's a it feels like a heartfelt responsibility to let folks know that we're out here doing this thing not only for the people who could utilize what we have to offer but also for other people who are doing other things like you don't know how happy I am just to see us all here <laughs> because sometimes it feels like I am by myself not because I am, I know I'm not, but like joining Black Girls Pilates and joining Black Girls Do Yoga and joining Black Girls Run, like all those places were like, oh, whew, a place I could, yes, to be, be cliche, exhale. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we want to know. We want to know. So tell us. We want to know you're out there. So tell us. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Um, and then the last item I have on this checklist here. Oh, actually, I saw something in the I saw something in the chat. Um, 
What can help combat icky feelings are all of these inclusivity practices. So if you're marketing a $5,000 health program, having a sliding scale scholarship, free education, downloadables, self-led e-course options, free Facebook group supports. Yeah, that can absolutely help, right? Um, different ways that different people can get involved and so that it's accessible to everyone. Um, yay. So happy to see you here, Shanzetta. Um, and uh, uh, Re, what Anka mentioned about sharing what other people are doing, a great way to get comfortable with marketing, spreading the word is practice by sharing what other practitioners in your realm network are doing. It's so much easier to sell other people. Absolutely. I love that. And that's such a great way too of, um, like that's such a great, that's like a, a great reason to work with another business, right? Because they can tell their people about you and you can tell your people about them. And it's like, oh, you could just talk someone else up who you totally are aligned with and you believe in and you support. And then you all can be supporting each other and supporting your broader communities together. So super beautiful. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to the next checklist, check item on the checklist, which is prepare a business plan. And I've kind of reframed this a little bit as well. Um, uh, so reimagining a business uh, business plan and really thinking of it as your wellness practice blueprint. So this is um, people often think of business plans as um, in the traditional sense as this kind of long kind of detailed document that you write for the purpose of presenting your business idea to an investor. That's often how people talk about business plans. And you can absolutely do that, but it doesn't have to be just that. You don't have to be looking for an investor to create this roadmap. It's just helpful to have this roadmap. It's just helpful to get a clearer idea of what you want to do. It could even just be one page, right? So um, some of the things you want to get clear on as you move forward is what is the purpose of your of your of your service of your of your organization of your practice why does it exist what does it hope to achieve what are the principles it's upholding and pursuing its goals right so you want to know like what is that and for me it's just helpful to have all this in one place so i have this roadmap right or this blueprint um the people it's designed to serve whether it's a really clear demographic um like the club promoting mom-owned entrepreneurs or is it um, people who are on a journey and who want to take this journey, this mind body journey with me, right? However you frame it, being clear for yourself, who is it designed to serve? Um, what exactly is being offered? Is it um, you know, a service? Is it a product? Is it both products and services, right? Just being really clear on that. Uh, how you're gonna let people know about what you're doing. Is it gonna be, uh, direct communication? Is it going to be um, through strategic alliances with other organizations that you share values with? Is it going to be through ads on Instagram? Whatever it may be, right? What are your outreach methods? Um, organizational mechanics, which is basically uh, how you do what you do, right? And we'll talk a, a little bit about kind of broader principles that you might want to follow on that. Um, and then how the business functions um, and sustains you, your community, the planet, whatever it may be, sustainability. So these are just the things you wanna have in your blueprint. And this is gonna shape, um, it's gonna help you shape how you wanna use your own time and your resources. And during the break, actually Heather and I were chatting a little bit um, and talking about how for people who are in the wellness space, it's, we're a community who who wants to give. I mean, you're not in the wellness space unless you want to, and looking at it through a anti-capitalist lens, if you want to give, you want to, you want to see other people succeed and be well and 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 move in that direction, in a healthy direction in their lives, a holistic direction in their lives and the planet moving in that direction as well. And we have I want us also to know to take care of ourselves, right? So we need, like when I talk about sustainability, I mean our own energy and resources as well, right? Not just giving, 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 but also knowing like, what are my limits and how do I give to a point that is sustainable for myself as well? 
And, you know, for me, it's up and down. Like some days it's like, whoa, I'm working all day. Every minute of the day I'm working. And then that means the next day needs to be a little bit of a break or it might be a week where I'm working super hard because there's a big deadline coming and then I slow down. But finding out like what, where are your own personal limits and being sure that you're working within those in the long term, right? That's sustainability. And that's an important part of sustainability to me. Um, and then you can, you know, expand on any of these um, and be more detailed and nuanced. Some other things you can think about uh, including are um, community needs, right? Like detailing the systemic challenges and struggles faced by the communities who you're trying to serve um, and recognizing these these challenges as products of capitalist structures, right? That could be in your um, blueprint as well. Um, uh, how you're serving a community uh, with maybe profits, right? You might include that in your blueprint if you're gonna have that element of your, um, of your practice in there. Um, your unique holistic approach to um, how you address these challenges, right? That go beyond profit-driven solutions, focusing on wellness, on social justice, on empowerment. You know, you might have a really unique approach. Maybe that goes in your uh, blueprint, right? There, and there are a lot. I'll drop a few more here. Um, an equitable exchange model, how you sustain your services, learning and differentiate, differentiation, collaborators, a resource plan for sustainable impact. Um, maybe you have a collective vision with um, potential allies or collaborators or contributors. Um, so lots of things you can put in there, but really the idea is how can you, uh, it's to create something you can come back to and say like, this is what I do. This is how my this is how I run my business. These are the values that are most important to me. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to be able to come back to. And for me, I'll say this too. Um, it's been so helpful to have something I can keep going back to, whether it's my plan um, or my blueprint, which I don't have like a really very well fleshed out one as I continue kind of settling where I'm going to land. Um, but even just having those principles that I can go back to, because when you get caught up or when I've gotten caught up in just like running this, it's easy to lose. It's been easy for me to lose sight of those values and like get distracted by like some other kind of shiny object or um, some, you know, uh, ad or something that says, oh, you got to do it this way. This way is the best way, right? But if I just keep going back and going, look, this is what's important to me. This is what I want to focus on. It helps me maintain my focus. It helps me serve my communities and it helps me keep my business sustainable for me, right? My own energy, my own personal resources. So great to have, if you're a person who likes to have a blueprint, and it helps keep you focused, highly recommend. Um, and then in our last 30 minutes, I can't believe this day has gone by so fast. I have kind of two more sections I want to go through. Um, but before we do that, any questions, any thoughts coming up for folks? Okay, I'm going to keep on going. And if anything comes up, just jump right in. So now we're going to talk about operationalizing that's such a funny word to me like anything with like eyes or ising um it's so businessy um but i like it in this in this um context because we need to talk about we have these like big lofty principles right that we've talked about but how do they play out day to day that's what i really need to be thinking about like how do i take these holistic principles we talked about the people before profits, sustainability, economic justice, systemic change, community focus, rest. How do I take those and change them from just like beautiful ideas and values and build them into my business like nuts and bolts? How do we do that? Obviously gonna be so completely different for everybody, but I'm, I'll offer a few um, suggestions, a few things I've played with, a few things that I've seen done really, really, really well for each one of these. Um, and I'd love to hear from you all too. So um, starting with people before profits, um, really great ways to operationalize this value. We've already talked about a lot about this, um, having an equitable pricing model. Um, one thing we talked about in addition to um, being givers and giving of our time and our energy, there's also 
not giving away um, resources that we don't have yet, right? So having this equitable price model fits into that to me because you can have a, like the higher price for the folks who can afford it, the folks who wanna pay, um, and then use that what you receive to then redistribute. So I'll actually give an example um, on people before profits. I'll give an example that I, I, I did, something I did that I'm super, super proud of, but I wanna also give my, share my inspiration for this. Um, so there is a prenatal yoga teacher in the Bay Area. I'm very well respected, very well experienced. Um, her name is Jane Austen, she's incredible. And she offered a free prenatal teacher training certification. So the training and the certification from her um 100 free to black women black women identified individuals um and i it was such a cool amazing thing to do and i went and the experience i had was so incredibly powerful because i'd been doing teacher trainings you know i did my first teacher training in 2010 and this teacher training was i think in 2020 maybe 2020 or 2021 thereabout. Um, and I stepped into this space and it was on Zoom. And it was like, you know how you have 25 on a screen? It was screen after screen after screen after screen of all black women identified individuals. And I was just like, I could cry. Every time I just hopped onto the Zoom, I could just cry. I loved it so much. And it was such a tremendous inspiration for me that I created, um, it's kind of a long story, but I promise the payoff is super worth it because it's a huge learning for me. Uh, I worked with a local um, a yoga studio where I, or yoga organization where I got my training, the Integral Yoga Institute. And I said, I wanna do this. I wanna create a 100% scholarship uh, based BIPOC yoga teacher training. No one has to pay a penny. Like I wanna figure out how we can do this together. Um, and they said yes, and and would they um, kind of pushed back a little bit on the totally free? They said we'll make it scholarship based. People pay whatever they can, any amount. Like if it's zero, cool. If it's the full two thousand dollars, which we normally pay charge for teacher trainings, whatever. I was like, cool, hundred percent scholarship based. Everyone pay what you want. We had just under thirty participants and several paid the full price. And I'm telling you, we did not say pay it. We said, pay what you want. I was really clear on all the language and several people paid the full price. And I got to tell you, the fact that that happened enabled the organization to do it again, right? So like people will pay if they, like, if they have it and they support it and they believe in it and they understand your equitable pricing model, people will pay. So I just offer that as just like a little, a ray of sunshine and this idea of like pay what you can. Um, it's just a, it's beautiful. Yeah, I could cry like I could literally cry thinking about that teacher training and the people who paid the full price. So yeah, thumbs up to them. Um, and then we talked about honest communication and then respectful um, practice alignment. So just making sure your practice aligns with the roots of the wellness traditions. You know, you know Meg talked beautifully about this respecting their original contexts and cultures and meanings. And I know for me, that involves continuous education. Um, it can uh, include respectful representation, collaboration with individuals from the cultures where these practices originate. Um, so yeah, great ways to explain, um, great ways to explore how people before profits can actually be used like day to day in your business. Um, and Heather, love that and have had similar experiences being delighted by people's willingness to pay when not required, absolutely. I feel like um, like I've been so jaded, right, by capitalism's like everyone's just me, me, me. I want my money and no one else gets any, but it's not true. We're out there, we're all out there. So yeah. Love it. I was gonna say about that coming from the music industry originally, it was like huge way back in like 2000 that radio had put up the first album where they just asked for a suggested donation and sold their album that way. And it shocked the music industry because everybody told them that like it would be an unprofitable album because it was put up for free. But they shared later that they averaged higher than the suggested album price um, overall, even though some got it for free and some got it for two dollars. 
I think it was like, you know, suggested 15, but they were averaging like 20 from the donations. And inspired by that, when I just did a private project for myself and and wrote a book, I put it up with a suggested donation of, I don't know, nine or ten dollars. And a, a, about 200 people downloaded it for free, but on average, because of people overpaying, I averaged $12. So that's dividing all of the people, the zeros, the $2, the $3, because, you know, I was like so delighted, like a doctor friend who I don't even think wanted to read the book at all. I don't think he probably read it, threw down, you know, hundred and fifty dollars like oh my gosh what is that you know I'm I'm pretty like bet a million dollars he didn't read the book but it's like people um who are able are inspired by that generosity and paid for it yes yes I love that yeah the, the inspired by that generosity yeah I love it I love it Thank you. Yeah. And I see Crystal, I had a similar experience with my yoga teacher training. It was for BIPOC people or allies and there were screening um, of black and brown faces looking at me. Yes. Oh my gosh. I was just like, every time I would like sit on Zoom and just like scroll <laughs> through every screen just to see just all those beautiful black and brown faces. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. So we can do this. We can do it. We can put like people for profits doesn't have to just be this like this beautiful idea. Like we can bring it down into like the day to day of what we do. Um, sustainability. And I, I promised Mel I would talk about this ethically sourced materials. Right. So talking about, um, you know, sacred um, plants, right, like white sage or talking about crystals or Palo Santo, you know, we're wellness practitioners and the wellness um, space, the wellness market, or I don't know what I'm trying to say, but just like all of us together, a lot of us use those things. So really, I'm such a big proponent on ethically sourced materials, um, which not only reduces harm to the environment, but just also respects the labor involved in the supply chain. Um, so super important, super important. Um, yeah, and these items that have such um, significant cultural and environmental implications as well, right? You really want to purchase these from suppliers who respect indigenous rights, maintain sustainable harvesting practices, like all that's super important to me. Um, adopting green practice uh, practices in your daily operations and some cities, if you, you know, get that, um, I think it would be enough to have your DBA, your sole practitioner, they give out like they put uh, green operations on lists and people can look for you. People who share those values can look for you. Um, so a wonderful way, actually going back to what Meg was talking about, about marketing being uncomfortable, like a wonderful way of um, letting people know what you do is living in your into your values because people will learn about you that way. So um, I should, I don't know if that was on, if that would fit into one of those marketing categories, but that's actually a really beautiful way. I guess that'd be like alliances. Um, and then also partnering with suppliers who also prioritize sustainable practices, super important. Um, all right, we'll keep going. Um, economic justice, we talked a lot about this sliding scale fees, um, donating profits is beautiful. I have one friend, um, she's a meditation teacher, she's pretty popular. And she, every quarter, she takes some percentage of her profits and donates the, actually I don't even think it's her profits I think she just donates across the board 10% of everything she makes to every quarter she picks uh, something she believes in and donates to them I love that practice I haven't adopted that yet in that format um, but I really love that idea so just finding ways to donate to causes that work for you I'm kind of more of a like end of the year like give my money or like as it kind of comes up not organized um, and then financial transparency, um, sharing where your revenue goes, demonstrating your commitment to fairness and economic justice, sometimes financial dis transparency just within your organization if you start having employees and, and things like that. Really, really powerful contributing toward economic justice. Um, you know, I read about, I'm like kind of hesitating to talk about this person because they have done other things since then. So I won't name them. You can you could probably figure out who it is if you look it up. But there was a CEO who earned, I think if I remember, over a million dollars a year, paid themselves over a million dollars a year as a for-profit, huge financial credit card processing something or um, corporation. And 
I don't know what happened, like what inspired this change, but he cut his own salary to $70,000 so that he could pay everyone in the organization $70,000. So every single person in the organization, regardless of what level they were at, made a minimum of $70,000 a year, including him, like 70,000 across the board. And I just thought that was so cool. Like still, when I think about it, I'm just like, wow, that's not what most massive conglomerates do. Um, but he like gave that real financial transparency and then like stepped into his values around that. So, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I'll keep going. So systemic, we talked about systemic change. So you can use your platforms to share content, right? To share educational content about systemic issues within your um, industry or community collaborative partnerships, um, like I talked about working with um, that. Uh, I've done a few collaborative partnerships that I love, but there are so many examples, don't even know where to start with that. Um, but working with organizations that are striving for systemic change by, um, in many ways, you can offer your services at a discounted rate or for free. Um, you can highlight them in your own messaging, however you choose to do that. Um, and then industry engagement. So getting involved in committees or boards in your industry so that you can advocate for systemic changes um, on a broader level as well, right? And you, you know, you can represent your, your business in like some sort of committee or board uh, that promotes systemic change. That's something I really kind of dream about one day, like to be like, oh yeah, Attuned Living is a sponsor of this thing. That's kind of like my vision of the future supporting some organization in that in like a really big way. Um, uh, community focus, being community focused, like how to put that into work. Um, you can have informational sessions, community workshops, um, make relationships with local businesses and organizations, um, offer free or discounted training programs uh, to folks who hold marginalized identities, um, offering new skills and opportunities. Um, yeah, there's so many great examples of this. I've seen people have like um, like internship programs, but not, I have a lot of opinions about internship programs, but internship programs that actually lead to training people to actually working within the organization. I love that. Um, I hesitated on internship programs because I've just seen so many really um, highly resourced organizations that have finances and of the you know financial viability use interns as like free labor and don't actually train them up with skills that they can then take on or even like move up into the organization. So I have critique about that, but there are lots of ways that we can train people. And we when you use interns, they don't necessarily have to be free too. The, but the, the sky really here is the limit on community focused on all of these. Um, and then rest, how do we operationalize rest? And for me, that really looks like just having really clear boundaries between my work and my personal time. Um, I definitely have, I'm not always great about having off days, but I definitely like minimize technology use. And when I'm re really active with an uh, individual, I don't do a lot of work with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, but when I do, I try to be really clear about like, this is when I'm available. This is when I'm not. That helps me. I'm um, being mindful about scheduling, both in like the micro, just like in a day. Like, do I take X amount of time away from my screen to kind of the larger? Like, do I take weeks off every year? And I try to take some time off. Um, I don't know that I take weeks off every year, but I try to take some, have mindful scheduling. And I guess that feeds right into regu uh, regular time off super important um so yeah those are some thoughts but you know sky's the limit on all of these just some things to get you started to think about it any questions i'm start i'm i'm like trying to get through it before we get to the end but we have time for questions if anyone has any all right i'm gonna keep going and this is kind of my last last section here, um, which is the path forward, right? What What's next? What do we do? <laughs> what do we do next? So I'm going to actually 
stop talking for a moment. I'm going to be in silence for, I said 30 seconds, but I'm going to give you a minute. Um, and I want you to just take some time to write down what your most important business goals are right now for your practice. Um, it doesn't have to be three. I wrote down three. That's super arbitrary. It could be one. It could be five, but however many. And if you're not even sure where to start, like maybe that's the next goal, like figuring out where to start, right? Whatever it is, just write something down and I'm gonna be quiet for a minute. All right, so I hope you all had a chance to write something down. And um, and in the workbook, I don't think I'm going to go through all of this, but it's all in the workbook for you. Um, kind of like one of the earliest tools I learned in my coaching was how to actually actualize visions, how to actually have goals that can come to completion and, and happen come to fruition and um, the tool that the tool that I learned was called smart goals um, and I'll just go through smart is an acronym and I'll just go through what it stands for um, and we'll talk a little bit about each one but um, it's that when you have a goal you ensure that it's specific measurable achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And I've actually seen different words there. And the point really is that you know exactly where you wanna go, the specifics like numbers around how it's gonna happen so you can measure it. So you know when you've done it and you know how long, you have a reasonable um, timeline for yourself to get it done, right? So if my, goal is to um, build a 10 page website, right? Like if that's where I start, like I wanna, or I want a huge website. I want like an amazing website um, and be present on the internet. It's like, that is, that's really vague. And I could do it, you know, like maybe I have a vision in my mind and I can work toward it, but it can be very, very helpful if I don't really know how to get there to make that goal meet these, um, like fulfill these uh, qualities. So specific, so what exactly do I want to accomplish? Why is this goal important? Who is it involved? Where, where is it gonna be done? Um, and what resources uh, or limits are involved, right? So getting it really specific. So it's like the who, what, where, when, why questions. You wanna be able to answer all those and then you are getting to somewhere more specific. Um, so measurable is how do I know it's done? So like how much am I, do I want it? Like a number, like how many pages are gonna be on this website? Um, can I measure its completion, right? Super important, that's the M. Is it achievable? Like how can I accomplish it? Um, how realistic is it, right? So making it really realistic. Relevant, this was a good one for me when I was getting started, relevant. It's like, do I, Am I the right person for this? Like, yeah, I can do it, but am I the right person? Does it fit in with um, kind of my my purpose, my blueprint we've we've created? Um, does it does it fulfill my values? Am I meeting my values if I do this? Right, that's kind of the the relevant piece. Um, and then time bound. When is it going to happen? When's it going to be done? Is it six months? Is it a year? Is it weeks? Is it days? Um, what can I do today to move me forward? So we wanna get really, really specific on these goals. So maybe what you wrote down already meets all those requirements, great. If not, I'm gonna give you a minute <laughs> to start moving it in that, that direction. Maybe you can fulfill all five of those. Maybe you can make it fulfill all five of those, but 
Um, if you can't in a minute, at least one. I'll give you a minute for that. All right, friends. So hopefully you have or you're on your way toward having some next steps for yourself. And I'm going to spend about two more minutes just talking about navigating obstacles because they're going to be obstacles and they're things that um, keep us from fulfilling our goals, right? No matter how smart they are um, in the acronym sense. Um, there are things that get in our way and sometimes they're internal right it might be fear or overwhelm sometimes they're they're sometimes they're external right sometimes there are systemic issues that are standing in our way that keep make it difficult for us to move forward so i want to talk about um, navigating obstacles together and how we get past those um, and i invite you to, to take some time to think about maybe what's gotten in the way for you if you have things that have gotten in the way and then let's just talk about how maybe we can navigate them together. I, I put some things together um, that have really helped me. Um, you know, first I start by acknowledging whatever I'm feeling, right? I'm going to have a feeling about it, recognizing it, acknowledging it, um, giving myself empathy around it, uh, writing it down so I'm really clear on what's happening, uh, and, and just holding myself with care around it. Um, and then seeking support, right? Finding a supportive community who understands your struggles um, and can support you through it. Um, this might include seeking out allies who can use their privilege to start to help dismantling some of these systemic, bar systemic barriers. You can also build your own community. That's one of the stories I love about um, Heather's The Mamahood. It's a community she built because she didn't, she didn't see it existed, so she created it herself. Um, totally an inspiration to me. I um, mean, we can do that too. We can create our own support, supportive communities too. If what we're looking for isn't out there, we're not finding it. Um, we can engage in advocacy work for our community as well as for communities who hold marginalized communities that we might not share, right? And engaging in this kind of cross community advocacy helps to foster this sense of interdependence where we're all supporting each other, right? It expands our networks. And so that's another way we can start navigating obstacles. Um, as wellness practitioners, we can engage in our own wellness techniques, right? I know for me, when I'm feeling stuck um, or I'm feeling caught up in my head and, and not in my body or in my heart, I'll just turn to my practices, meditation, yoga, uh, maybe visualization is part of your practice. Maybe affirmations are part of your practice. Whatever it is, use what you have already, the tools you have in your own tool belt to move you through it. Um, and then implement heart and mindset strategies. Um, I found this list of mindset strategies. I see that a lot. And I thought, well, what about my heart? I want to get my heart set right too. So heart and mindset strategies. Uh, I have a list in the workbook of some of these um, and I'll go through them quickly now. But this right here is super powerful because we're we all we all need help sometimes we all get stuck sometimes we all need help um so here's some strategies that um that i have found helped i'm just gonna go through them is keeping the focus on impact like understanding like what the impact that you can have on this world is and keeping the focus on that and i know for me that keeps me going like with marketing like i was talking about um being 
like the importance of challenging capitalist ideals of living. I mean, I could just say living in line with my values um, and, and focusing on that, right? That keeps me going. Um, creating mindful deadlines. So um, having an end date in mind, but also with you know my smart goals, but also allowing time for rest, allowing time for um, the unpredictable organic flow of life, right? So keeping that in mind, that's helpful to me as well, right? So if I need to take something a little slowly because I'm a little scared, that's okay. Um, setting really intentional goals, we talked about that. Nurture and grow. This one's so good, useful for me, which is instead of thinking like of a big thing, like or if I do have a big thing in mind and I just feel like, oh my gosh, I can't, it's too big. I like just thinking of it in small pieces and just like little tiny pieces that I could just nurture and grow and then move on to the next step and move on to the next step. I was thinking of that exact thing when I picked this um, picture. I just loved that picture so much. So nurture and grow. Um, and then cultivating collective power, right? Um, there's so much, um, so like our own power, like I think of this in terms of my own personal power. So instead of thinking like, oh, I have to do this, um, or I really should do this. I'm sure you've heard about the, 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 like the oppressive power of should really, right? to refine my, redefine my approaches, I choose to, finding where I'm empowered, right? That can really shift the dynamic from this hierarchical power over paradigm into a more equitable power with paradigm, right? And then embracing that within my organization as well, right? And then finally, uh, I hope I have one more on there, let's see. Yeah, create spaces for focus. So distractions are a part of life but really carving out some time, some quiet, whether it's a physical space or just like an emotional mental space uh, in my meditation practice, that's where I create some space for myself. And these are really powerful ways to kind of get me through the stuck, stuck times. So I hope that's helpful too. So we're right at three o'clock. I cannot believe it. This day went by so fast for me. Um, I'm just gonna put up this quote up here um, which I love from one of my greatest inspirations, Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Um, so yeah, I didn't have that up on my, um, on my navigating obstacles, like having an inspiration, having something that inspires you front and center, keeps us going. So my friends, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us up there. It's 3:01. I'm sorry it's running a little late. I'm here though. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to stay on. Um, and I'm just so I bow to each and every one of you for giving me your time and attention this day on a Sunday on a weekend. Um, I'm so honored to be in your company and oh, and drop in your chat your um, your URLs and your emails and all the things I would love to know your or your social media handles. I'd love to know what you're all up to and I'm happy to follow anyone who gives me their social media. So thanks so much, friends. I'll turn it back over to you, Mel. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, could you possibly uh, pop host back over to me so I can download some things? Absolutely. I'm going to stop my share. Thank and you. Let's get you on there. All right, everyone, um, you know, I'd like to once again, thank um, itself because if you've looked at this workbook, there's a lot of information in there that you can, you know, take your time, chunk it out. Um, I was going through it whenever we were sitting here and I was just blown away. So I appreciate you for that. Um, you know, just a general reminder, we are a nonprofit. So if you have means and you're open to donating, you can easily go to our website, uh, click donate. It's it's pretty quick and painless. If you're not in a place to donate, then you can share with your community members. You can tell a friend. You can, um, I don't know, put it on next door, put it on your groups um, and just spread the word. That's super helpful for us. And then if you are in the Bay Area, we do have a series of events. We are back in the Menlo Park Rec Center. They are working with us um, 
and classes are all free through them. So they're free for us too, but we're really excited to change the culture of a community center that historically charges for everything. And they're bringing us in and about one thing of us going in was we have to keep our classes free. And so, you know, they are luckily paying Banyan to come in and teach classes and they are still giving them to the community for free. So check out the website, lots of fun things going on. And then for those of us, um, for those of you that like to do the challenges, we always do the group challenge July and January. July 12th is information night. We will do the um, 10 day reset. Um, and part of that is um, cooling foods, nurturing foods, um, dressings, bowls, salads, smoothies, good healthy drinks, and a lot of rest. So there's going to be a lot of restful classes offered during those 10 days for you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us um, through info at banyanwomen.org or directly melissa at banyanwomen.org. Um, and I know it's is always available too. Make sure to email her. Um, this class will go up on our YouTube at some point next week. Best way for you to know when is just to follow the Banyan True Women's Collective YouTube and it will let you know when it's up. This class replay will be up for a limited time. So you'll have pretty much through the summer to watch, take notes, and then we're going to take it down. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. I told you, you have anything else? No, that's it. Just thank you so much, Banyan. And I was thinking about marketing. I was thinking, what if people didn't know what you did, Mal? It would be a disaster. See, this is why marketing is important. We need to know what's out there. We love you. Yeah. Yeah. Marketing. I, I was listening to that. Um, some of the responses, um, marketing is necessary. I mean, how many times do you fall in love with a movie and you want everybody to know about it and you want to tell them about it, or you love a food or like you're, you're selling it. So if you have a really good, strong understanding of who you are, take the time to don't rush this process. I will tell you, I've had so many people approach me to teach for Banyan that um, the alignment wasn't right. And there's one in particular um, who came from a really reputable source and in all fairness is doing good work in that sector. But I said, you know, have this person reach out to me, have them send me, I wanna know their, their values. I wanna know their mission, vision and values. And there were just a lot of words in there that were not inclusive. And so I respectfully passed on it. And that person asked me, we, are you going to, you know, are you going to talk to my friend? And I said, you know, I don't think that it aligns. And they were really shocked. And, and they asked me why. And I told them, and there were some terms that they just latched on to this. This is a younger practitioner. She latched on to a lot of buzzword terms and had no clue that the term that she was using was actually a turf term that totally discounted trans women. And it also discounted women that um, may not be able to bear children or simply don't want to bear children. And that doesn't align with my vision for Banyan. And so it's interesting if you don't take the time to really know who you are and be careful about what you present, you could be presenting something that just really isn't aligned with you and you just don't know. And it's hard to go back from that. That person offered to change words for me and I said, I'm not here to change a practitioner's words. I can only take the words that they give me to know who they are if it aligns and I wish them well in the work that they do. But going back and changing a word because you didn't do the justice of knowing what you were putting out there that can be really dangerous. And so take time to know who you are. Don't rush that process. I'm really set with it. And and who you are is, is important. And if that's if that takes longer than you would like, be patient because it is a journey. But sometimes it's hard to go back if we just throw stuff out real quick or like the website names and the branding. It can get costly. 
it can get so costly. So take your time, take your time and, and honor yourself on who you are and what you truly have to offer. All right, friends. Yes, everyone is, everyone is dropping their information in. So if there's anything that you want to copy out of the um, chat box and give you one more minute to copy that off, and then we're going to close out. Beautiful. You're welcome. You're welcome. There's so many thank yous. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm going to drop. I also I'm, I made a quick little feedback form that I'm going to drop in there. But really what I mostly want to know is if we were to do a workshop on any one of those specific topics to do a deeper dive, I would love to know what would be of most interest to you all. So that's kind of the most important question <laughs> on that. So just let me know if there's any interest on there. If you get a chance, I appreciate it. That's good. I copy that. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, friends, going once, going twice. All right. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Whatever that looks like, please take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye, friends.